We're talking people oh. who get locked into a vision. That's right. We'll just go right into it. All right. It. That's it, man. That's their drive. That's their passion. Critics don't matter. This don't matter. They're going to do whatever it f***ing takes to be the best at what they do. This is Dave Tate with another edition of Table Talk. As you all know by now, I don't have an introduction. So today I got Mark Bell and introduce yourselves. And Seema Eyang. Andrew Zaragoza. Okay. And that's yeah, what these we are have. My, some of my podcast uh, hosts here. Yep. And uh, we're just talk, talking some shop, and we're talking about Scott Mendelson. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just saying how he's one of our favorites because he's just he's just over the top himself, mm -hmm. and then and then some maybe even you know, and he might be a little too much for uh, most people to handle. But I I kind of like it. And you were just telling a story about how he's teaching people to. Uh, pull the weight down towards their chest mm -hmm. that the bar stops for him like it did for myself many years you get so bound up you get so tight it comes out and you can't touch 135 you're like fuck yeah this is good stuff man this is great you know <laughs> this is i'm gonna be super strong and it was funny when i was listening to him teaching this because while i kind of agree with what he's saying it's like he just assumed it, everybody that's that way and that at a certain point, everybody's just going to have to pull the bar down. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking, you do realize that from normal people that bench press, so forget about power lifters, so 99.99999% of all people are never going to pull the bar down. It's just going to come down. And it's going to touch, and they're going to be like, "What the?" Especially if it has 200 pounds on there. Yeah, they're like, it's going to come crashing yeah, down. Like, how do you pull a pressing movement? <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? That's like if you're going to do rows, you should push it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just to me, it was just funnier and fuck because I've been doing this for a long time. So you realize if you're talking with other people that have been lifting for a long time and doing it, there's a certain narrative you can have. But the regular people, you got to like back it down and say, well, you know what? This just bring the bar down with control. Right. And make sure you hit the same spot every time. And yeah, he had <laughs> yeah. 225 just hovering because he's so thick and so jacked yeah. that he needed that weight just mm -hmm. to kind of squish him down into position. Yeah, I think Halbert at one point needed like 315 holy shit it was crazy it's like what the hell and he wasn't i mean he was muscular but he wasn't yeah, big yeah just so bound up from that and it, i don't know how much that's really going to help her all i can't really say one way or another but for sure it definitely helped because you've learned how to control the weight but that's a different it just struck me as funnier in hell mm -hmm. because you're watching him and i think he was filming his training at the time like he was going to try to bench a grand this mm. not too long ago yeah and I'm like, oh, this is something I can kind of get behind and watch and see if he can pull this off because it'd be kind of cool because he's tried a lot of times. Yeah, he won't and, give, He won't stop. He yeah, won't it's like, like 135, I can't get that fucker lower than a quarter. I'm like, <laughs> oh, shit, this dude's ready. He's prime. <laughs> and a 405 is almost touching. I'm like, this, this is this is. He's this looking like good, a, pr you know? a primed athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Then I got distracted. I don't know what happened because I got distracted and quit following it. Uh, what do you think about someone like Mendy who he – like when we had him on, he was like, I eat, sleep, live, do everything for powerlifting. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, he's still putting everything all in. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe he was too hyper-focused on just that one thing, that one goal of being – the the uh or looking at the next lift instead of maybe i mean shit look around where we're at right now like what look what you were able to turn everything into it i have two ways to answer that mm -hmm. right so i have i have the one way that i was that for probably well i was that probably from 80 85 to 2005 so i know that i lived that probably longer than 2005 it was a very hard thing to transfer out of yeah but you yeah you pivoted jim pivoted like some people yes. were able to pivot before they were too yes. stuck and, and the the important thing so i understand that and i don't think it's a bad thing but i think where a lot of people are missing that message if i say that is they need to understand that scott still has several businesses he still has been doing things in the background to be able to support his powerlifting now maybe it, the only intent for him for a long period of time was only for it to support his powerlifting. Same way for myself, you know, going to school, getting a degree, personal training, building, you know, my resume underneath the cloud of powerlifting. But by no means was I going to do anything that was going to fuck up the powerlifting. But I was still doing, I wasn't laying on a couch playing video games, mm. not building that base because you still got to be able to pay for shit you know, to be able to power lift yeah. where a lot of people, if we're have that conversation are going to say, fuck it, that's all I'm doing. And then just start looking towards companies to pay them to support everything. And then they're 100% dependent on sponsorships and companies to be able to barely, 
if they can get to that point, barely cover their needs, which they're not even going to get to that point. When you were at Westside, what were you doing to build towards what you have now? When I was there, I'd already had my degree. So I was working as a personal trainer in the corporate fitness center. I did that for 10 years. So that was not really so much building this. This kind of was accidentally it. I still think I would have been in business for myself because my grandfather was my dad, my father, just it's been in my family for, I'm not, not that it's genetic or anything, but you saw it's, it's it. what the you see. Environmental, yeah. It's your dinner conversations and everything else. But I, I got to a point training people that you have clients from four thirty, five 5 o'clock in the morning, then leave at eight, eight thirty, go to Westside, come back at 10 30, 11, and then train people till 10 at night, six days a week for years on end and then you have a kid and you start asking yourself well what kind of father do I want to be mm -hmm. not, not saying I would have been a bad father if I still did that but is that the kind of father I wanted to be my dad was kind of like that I did not want to be like that that's where you start looking for what else can I do my clients started throwing ideas out what can you do at the time I was helping Louis do consultation consult consultation I can't say it consulting yeah. consulting yeah, yeah, yeah. and so there was that I was at that point Louie got sick of the seminars I was helping him with the yeah. seminars so he said Dave do the seminar so I was doing the seminars doing the consulting had the personal training and just didn't know where else anything was going to fit and so my wife was the bulk well now not that time because I was still training so I made more money training than I still make now. So mm. <laughs> 22 years later, it's still fuck. And <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's the joke of the whole thing. But I would never have had the time, yeah. you know, with my kids are 17, 16, 17 now, and I didn't miss anything. So that that's worth more than what money is. Mm -hmm. Long and short of it, my wife was training at Westside at the time. She was in the night crew, so morning crew night crew two different fucking things never even and see each other yeah. exactly and she was bitching because she hated her job and then louis said well why don't you just sell this shit that he had because we already had these other things that we were doing and he didn't it's shit like the man array safety squat bars weight releasers just incidental little things books he just wanted to sell the reverse hyper and not deal with any of the mail order shit and we're like, fuck it, we'll do that. So he gave us maybe $3,000 of product on consignment. We paid him when we sold it. And that was kind of the start of that. I think the first ads we put in Powerlifting USA were Westside Warehouse by Elite Fitness Systems because that was the company that I was doing business as for their personal training. And then over a period of time, more focus went on that, less on the training, and that became the way to, to have the free time that I didn't have before. I think but. that's important that people understand that, that you were, you were still working while mm -hmm. building towards your future, yes. while building towards your dream or looking at your dream, you were still working. Yes. You know, I think some people are, you know, now the, they're thinking I'm going to be an entrepreneur and all those things are, that's great. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have a good blueprint for it, but you need to get some sort of job. You, you know, I, I just always did whatever I could. I would yeah. be a bouncer or whatever, just making some money to be able to pay the bills mm -hmm. so I can one day, uh, you know, get myself in position to where I could make the kind of money that I wanted. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's two different ways to go about business. There's uh, using other people's money. And I don't know how to do that. Because I never yeah, did that. Do you know, I don't think you know how to do that either. Not so, how to raise money, huh? Yeah, we're going to be more biased towards you know bootstrapping, nickel and diming, and because I have a bias on that, people should understand there's the bias there. But I think when you do that, you, and you have to be hungry, you know, and you have to you, you learn you have to work all the time. Mm. Sometimes you can't get paid for your staff to be paid. You know, there's those all those things that you're not going to learn if you got somebody else's dime <laughs> that's going through that. I don't know if it's good or bad. I think it's good because then you understand what it's like to, you know, be the staff person. And if be the staff person, if it doesn't fit a certain culture or a certain way and understand, I think your vision becomes a little stronger mm -hmm. because of that. And you're, you're less, you have staff here. So I'm saying this, you're less patient with things that don't really fit the, the direction that you want to go. And, it's kind of been 
chiseled away and earned because of all the early sacrifices that sometimes you guys won't see. He may tell you stories. He may not, you don't know, but those, those shape a lot, you know, those shape a lot in two ways. It shapes a lot in where the direction that he's going to want to go is, but it also shapes a lot in being able to listen to other people's ideas and then disseminate those in a way that still fits that vision without being so stubborn. Do you feel like uh, in today's world, like things can just end up being a lot less painful or do you think that people still have to have like painful experiences in order to grow? I'm the wrong person to ask (laughs) because adversity has been my second name. So I, 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 I'm I feel that I feel the same way, but yeah. I just, you, there's so much like kind of self help, and there's so much information out there. There's so many spots to go to. Mm-hmm. There's so many different people that if you, it kind of seems like if you were to piece it together, that you could have things be fairly easy. But I'm sure you would still run into something that's gonna. I, I think it's gonna be a bigger punch in the face when it comes. Mm. Where if you get a lot of taps in the face when you're younger, and mm. even if you get blasted in the face when you're younger, you get blasted in the face later. It's not. It doesn't hurt as bad because you're used to it now after a certain period of time you be you can become calloused and, and that's not good either <laughs> but it's w- w- with prosperity comes adversity and adversity comes pros- it's just kind that's of been a, your experience yeah yeah without without a doubt you know other people it may it may be a different story maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy i've asked myself that a lot of fucking times you know if things are going really good then all of a sudden the shit hits the fan why did that happen is it just because it normally happens or did i kind of will this on myself mm-hmm. I don't know. I do better when my back's against the wall, but sometimes you don't want to do that. What's hurt more, uh, the numbers or personal stuff? Both. I mean, I, I'm thinking of situations with both. I mean, the personal stuff's always the worst. And that that I've never had that issue with business. I had that issue with not being able to accept the fact that I was not powerlifting anymore mm. or maybe I was holding on to it longer than what I really should have. And that created some personal issues that I'll never, that they'll be with me for the rest of my life because of that. And, but financially anything business wise, while it sucks and it can be stressful, it's just, it's just normal. I've, I've never, it's, it is, it is what it is. It's, it's, if you, how can I explain this? If, if you were to tell me that my squat's high, fine my squat's high i'm cool with that you're not saying nobody you would lo- ever say that to you. I, I know that but see the thing the thing is you're not telling me that you that you don't like me right you're telling me some attribute of something that i did you don't agree with that's not me that's that mm-hmm. those are entirely different things it's not a personal thing whatsoever if the business is having issues that's how i see that that's something completely different than anything that's really associated with me personally so if that was to fuck up and go south or whatever it is i'm not a failure because of that the business was not me it's different my family in my personal relationships now that is me that's you see the difference Mm -hmm. that that's where this must have taken a a long time for you to grow into this though right or do you feel like you knew this early adversely i mean you get hit enough times you kind of start (laughs) to figure out this hurts more more. sounds sounds really mature yeah this hurts way more than this does you know this i can probably live without this i don't want to live without you know could i live without yeah but i choose i don't want to i don't want to live without either you know what i'm saying but if there had to be a choice it's kind of an easy choice to make and i think everybody knows what that choice is but they don't know how to prioritize it all the time and they forget about it. And I, the other thing with adversity is, you know, take the word for what it is. Faith, you know, self-belief, what, whatever. You go through enough shit, you start to realize, you know what? A year from now, two years, this isn't going to mean a goddamn thing. It's, it's nothing. It's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. So when the stuff starts, shit starts hitting the fan, it's not as stressful because it's, it's going to be all right. It's going to be good. Just when, when I was powerlifting, you probably when you were powerlifting as well, you can be training for a meet. Your gear don't fit. Nothing's fucking going right. And just like, man, this meet's going to suck. But you know, it's going to be all right. It, everything works out. The bench shirts, for instance, you can't touch, can't touch, can't. You know what? It touches at the meet. I don't know why, <laughs> but it'll be all right. You know, so you have the worst training cycle ever, and you go to a meet and you crush your PRs. <laughs> Best training cycle ever, you go to a meet and you suck ass. <laughs> but it's all right. 
So you, I think I kind of learned that one through powerlifting mm. that no matter what's going on, at some point in time, it's still going to be okay. And that faith and belief is where I think a lot of people miss it. And they don't see that you still have to deal with the situation, but it's going to be okay. You know, down the line, it's going to be okay. Do you feel like you're the kind of grumpier, older powerlifter talking about, you know, the way things used to be, or you want to kind of see things being done the same way they used to be? Like, do you miss some of that? I don't think it should go back to being the way it used to be. That that's, it's, that's never possible. You know, I don't, if you don't have control over something, why are you going to stress about <laughs> right. it? It's not going to happen. Um, I, I, where the grumpiness and the rants come from is more like I was going to say You have a lot earlier, of them, by the way. I have a lot of them. It's more industry oriented because this is a, I've said this a, a bunch of times, it's a really fucked up industry. You know, in, in Wall Street, you know you're going to get fucked. In porn, you see people getting fucked. In the fitness industry, you know, you're not, you know, you don't know you're getting fucked till you're fucked. All right, that, that's 100% it. <laughs> right? There's the easiest way to explain it. And it's it's frustrating to me because this weight training thing powerlifting thing it changed my life you know it's i would either be dead and everybody says this but this is true i'd either be dead or in a juvenile or i'm older jail (laughs) you know but i mean those are the paths you know juvenile detention center or you know dead and i can go through and list 20 people that I knew between the ages of 13 and 20 that are dead because of suicide, drugs, murder, or whatever it was. So I, I'm pretty confident where I was going to end up, you know, with that. And close people to me from that. And that lifting thing, people taking me in, well, my dad throwing me in a gym, a powerlifting gym, because he got sick of taking me to court. But puts me in there, and there it's, it's run by a bunch of cops, so... My dad didn't think it wasn't a powerlifting thing. It was like there's a bunch of cops in here. Yeah, this is where my kids. Go. How old were you? Thirteen. So actually twelve. So I did my. I started training for my first meet when I was twelve because when I got in there, immediately it was you were training for a meet. I did didn't you, know. Did you like lifting at all? Your dad Loved just kind of said, "Hey, you're doing this." Yeah, I was fucking around a little bit in a garage, you know, with cement weight set. Mm-hmm. That didn't last long. As soon as he saw there was an interest, boom, put me in there, and then within that, with two maybe three weeks i'm training for a meet so my real beginner weight training experience was training for a meet and that changed everything because when i started getting stronger i wasn't the kid getting his ass kicked anymore you know i kind of overcorrected from that standpoint needed to come back the other way and because you you seek vengeance on those, but that's <laughs> You're another, like, I got power. Yeah. That's another, that's another story. <laughs> and, um, but those guys didn't have to help me. You know, I'm a snot nosed 12 year old kid in trouble. They didn't have to help me. They certainly didn't have to help me get ready for a meet mm. or take me to the meet. And then throughout that, it wasn't more than a couple of years later. I met Louie at a meet who was helping me in a warm up room Ed Cohn helping me in a warm up room before I was out of high school. Wow. Um, all these people just like come in, John Florio, people from Cleveland, all these people helping, they didn't have to do any of that, you know? So because of all of them combined, you know, I'm who I am, you know, I could have been something, I, who knows? Maybe I would have been bad. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know, but I am because of that. I didn't have to pay any of them, anything, you know? So a lot of this live, learn, pass on, it all stems from that. I owe them. And the only way I know how to pay them back is to help other people in the same situation. And what's frustrating to me, more so in powerlifting than anything else, because that's where I came up, is you, it, was, it was different back then. I don't know if it was right in many regards, because you, you had to kind of earn your way. into a, You weren't just walking in a gym and training with Mark's crew. You had to figure out where he was training, go to the gym, train off in the corner. I know you had to do this at some point. Go off mm-hmm. in the corner and make small talk, but not impose and get to a point where you can give a lift off or a spot. Yeah. Then like, man, come on over. So you earn your way into that crew. And then once you got in, it's like, fuck yeah. But then it was, for me, it was like, fuck yeah, now I'm gonna beat everybody here. Mm. Then when I'm better, I'm gonna find another crew <laughs> and just keep, and that's how I ended up at Westside was from that standpoint. But because of that, all those people, you know, shaped that, that person's way to go on. Now, you won't find that nobody's going to help you unless you pay them. Mm. 
that's where my problem comes. I'm, I'm f fine with people making money. Per I did it. I personally trained people for 10 years. But, you know, remember there's a lot of people that can't afford that. And those people that can't afford that, those are the lives you're going to impact. You know, the people that could have special needs, the people that, you know, don't have any other thing going on, you know, and maybe, maybe there's going to be 15 kids that you're going to help that they're still going to be fuck it, fuck offs. Mm -hmm. One's not, you know, and if one's not, well, what can they do? You know, what can, what they, you know, myself as an example, but you think those guys that ever helped me thought I would be doing what I'm doing now? Hell no. That's not why they did it. You know, they did it because they love the sport and they wanted to help these other people help the sport. That's where my grumpy old man comes from. Because when I see this stuff, I don't see people making money on a sport that I wasn't able to monop or monetize yeah. at the time. I see those people being left out that normally wouldn't be left out. Because those people were the ones during the time when the sport didn't have genetic freaks. There were some, you know, but not like now. Mm. Those are the ones that were placing second, third, fourth. You know, they got there just by grit, hard work, determination, and and faith. You know, that's how they got there, and they're not going to be there now. That that's my. I mean, they are right. I'm not going to say they're not, but the shit keeps going the way it's going. They're not going to be there now. For those people that you see are making money off the sport, selling mm -hmm. programming. I I work with people online. Mm -hmm. What? way do you think they can rectify the situation because I've toyed with that in my head too I know individuals that charge insane amounts of money and I've been like oh wow you're making a lot but I can't I can't justify that that's fucked up there's so many people <laughs> like college kids and shit that I can't work with yeah. because that is so much money so what way would you looking at the situation from your point of view can should these people try and help more people well, there's, I mean, through social media mm -hmm. and I'll just say social media because that's YouTube, that's everything, right? There's always ways to help people. Mm -hmm. There's always ways. So you can still provide content and still have a service. And that's, that's easy. The content doesn't have to be a freaking ad, you know, every single time because then the content becomes diluted mm -hmm. and nobody's going to want to watch it anymore because shut the fuck up. I don't care that you're selling a manual book training. What I, just tell them what to do. And it's, it's actually piss poor marketing too. So they're not going to last very long anyhow, but there's so many of them that it just keeps coming and going that I don't even bother looking at any of this shit anymore because it, why get frustrated over something I have no control over? Mm. So to answer your question, what can the person do? I think the answer is still to be determined, but if we look at other professions, uh, the legal system, um, doctors and stuff like that they're still doing professional services but they're doing with per diem where they where they help people for pro bono pro bono. bono yeah all right so i think the answer kind of lies in that model where x percentage of the hours per somebody's week when they get to a certain point is going to be pro bono mm -hmm. and then determine how to do that yeah, I think it's just as simple as uh, putting stuff out there with having zero expectation coming mm -hmm. back. Yes. I think that's why a lot of people, they um, they spend so much time on Instagram because they're like, oh, this is going to get me X amount of followers or this is going to do this and that. But I think like in SEMA, he does, he does put out a ton of content, especially with us now, mm -hmm. and, like we're following Mark. But I think, yeah, just expecting nothing in return. I think sometimes the... The people that rant, bitch, complain, myself included, you know, it's, I'm not going to exclude myself from things that are true. Because uh, I did, you know, I forget sometimes that the, the customer's smarter, you know, the people who are reading things are smarter than everybody's giving them credit for. So when people bitch about all the frauds in the industry, you seriously think that these guys are actually making money. They're not. They're, they're lying about it because people are not that dumb. You know, that you can fool somebody once or twice, but then after that, you're not going to fool them anymore. So the best trainers, online trainers or whatnot, they, they're going to rise to the, crop, uh, the top and they're going to get the clients that are going to be better lifetime value clients instead of the short term 10 week, eight week deal. And that's how a lot of those people are making their money are the eight week programs, but the real money is in the two year program, the three year program, not saying you're going to sell it for three years, but a lot of people in 
it's a new business. It's a new industry. This has only really been going on since maybe 2012, 2014, mm-hmm. right? Around, bodybuilding beforehand, but strength training right about that. So it's a new profession. People are kind of still figuring out what to do with it. But I kind of lost my train of thought with that. But they – um I did. I what, what about lost. what about helping people out like in a commercial gym? You know, like do you think it might be a disservice to, like, it, like if someone helped me and I'm in a commercial gym and I see somebody doing something the wrong way, do you think it's a disservice to the people that taught me to not go over to that person that might be doing something wrong? You know, because it's kind of a weird thing to like go it's over to thing. somebody and say, "Hey, man, you're doing this wrong." You know, um, how would you approach a situation like that, or do you think that's even positive? A- anymore, I won't. I won't. Uh, if they ask, I'll help so immensely. Handle it that way. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to give anybody unsolicited advice, right. even if it's in here. You know, if it's somebody in here visiting and they're training, if they're doing something that's really bad, <laughs> I just can't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> right. You know, that I'll say something with, but they don't want to get hurt. Yeah, man. I'm not going to give any unsolicited advice because to sound as bad as it is is a waste of my time. You know, there's a lot of other people that want the advice that I can give the advice to that it's actually a disservice to those people if I'm wasting all my time telling somebody, you know, stuff that they're really not even going to implement. Or I, that implements the wrong word. They're not going to listen to. Because mm. I don't expect anybody to do anything I ever say, but at least consider it, think about it, and, and go from there. Because there's, there's, a, there's a million ways to, to go about doing something and to not think that somebody that's been doing this for 10 years has a little bit of a clue what they're doing. That's that's a mistake. You know, most of, in your position, if you're training people and you have somebody that's been training 10 years seriously, all you have to do is get them to tell you all the answers. It's it's really it. You just have to pull it out. They already know. You know, they, And they usually want to share it. Yes, they do. When people are really knowledgeable about something, yeah. they usually feel good about sharing yeah. it. Yeah. That's the other thing that I learned, too, is when – because I was arrogant and a lot bigger mouth than I am now when I was 20 – 25 years old, you know, 20 to 30 years. I thought I fucking knew everything, everything. So a lot of my narrative, a lot of what I was speaking about in seminars, a lot of what I was presenting in conferences, I really wasn't talking to the people in the crowd. I was talking to all the other presenters in the back of the room, you know, so for their respect. And I didn't know it as much as I know it now because you're trying to earn your, you know, stripes and all the other stuff. But it's you find out later the longer you're around they don't give a fuck those people in the back of the room they really don't care they're only standing there to give you respect or for other people to think they're actually listening when they're really not they don't care the people that care are the ones that you're you're speaking to that are that pay you to come and then you're speaking over their head mm. so they can't understand a word that you're saying but you sound super smart so that's a dis- so anybody that's say 20 to 30 that's in this profession I cut a lot of slack to anymore and because I know what it's like to be there I've been there now if they're 30 and 30 and they're still doing that shit then I know they're not training anybody they're not been around it's just it's a lie because they would have already learned that you can't teach people with this way because they're not going to understand what you're saying and the interesting thing with that is the when, when people are f- learning, and I think you learn more of the educational side in your 20s because you're just sucking things up, man. You're yep. reading everything. You're just all over all that. And I think you should always do that if you're in the profession, but you're not going to have that same thirst when, you're, when you were 20 to 30. And if they're not teaching and they're not trying to help other people and to teach other people what they're absorbing – they're doing themselves a disservice because they're not learning because you learn by teaching you learn by absorbing but you also learn by teaching so if you're not teaching you're not going to learn it as well so that's why i can't complain because they're they're doing that step and without that step they're not going to know how to really be good when they're older you just with that comes the passive aggressive crap that comes out where you think that they're you know making digs on people that are older and so forth and maybe they are maybe they're not it doesn't really make any difference because it shouldn't matter but the people that are older should kind of stop and pause and realize you know what dude you if i can admit that i was that way then so can they because we all were i don't know anybody 
that wasn't. I know a lot that haven't accepted that fact. Yeah. But you can't do that and then judge other people for doing the same shit you used to do. You mentioned that powerlifting, uh, it saved, you know, saved your life and it kind of made or shaped your life. Uh, how did it do it? Like, how so? I think just the... I think I was born a meathead because it still hasn't gone away. So I think that's kind of a part I can't explain. So that I can't explain. You can't stop it, right? No, no, I've tried. I can divert it, you know, and, and just find different ways to do stupid My shit. name is Dave and I'm here today to let everybody know. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm admitting I have a problem yeah, I have a and problem. I'm turning it over to the group. Uh, yeah, I'm and, a fucking uh, meathead. And true true <laughs> meatheads are really hard to find. Really, So when I find one, I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's like, bro, love, man. <laughs> They're really hard to find. And um, I think the discipline was part of it. I think that I, re I understood really fast that, and I was never drugs and alcohol. I was never into any of that because alcohol tastes like shit and the other stuff I just never had any interest in. Alcohol does taste like shit. Yeah, it just tastes like shit. I never acquired a taste, you know, and I get you got to acquire a taste. Well, sorry, I never acquired <laughs> But no, fucking, it tastes like shit. It's a fact. Yeah, I know. It like, doesn't taste yeah. good. Yeah. Like Coke, Pepsi, shit like that, I shouldn't have. I'm all about that. People yeah. drink it for the effect, right? <laughs> mm hmm. Exactly. So I think the discipline from that, the. And I just love getting. So maybe I love getting stronger because I got the shit kicked out of me all the time when I was younger. So I was like, now I get stronger, then people stop. And they did. And so there was that. But then that kind of kept growing. Like, okay, I'm stronger now. I compete. I, when I competed, I wanted to place as high as I could, but I didn't really care that much about winning. To me, it was a PR thing. And there was a guy I used to lift with named Rob Fuzner, who was in my class, a super, super strong. And I, him and I were sharing a hotel room at one of the nationals one year, and we had this conversation about which would you rather do, have PRs or win? He's like, win. I mean, it, it fucked me all up. Now, wait a minute. So if you got a 900 squat and you only squat 800, <laughs> but you win you're cool with that it's like fuck yeah if i only have to squat 800 then i only have to squat 800 that's easier i'm like, i'm so baffled by this i just can't figure it out i'm like man i'd either i'd rather be dead last and hit all prs <laughs> and there's, there's two different mindsets mm -hmm. you know then you have chuck who had the mindset he just didn't want to lose so it wasn't about winning who could he could not fathom the idea of losing i couldn't figure that one out either <laughs> and i guess that's where the adversity thing comes in i taught if you've had adversity your whole life you're kind of used to being a loser and it's not a big deal you don't like it but fuck it i'm okay with it if that's the way it's got to be but that was that was different because there's different mindsets in the sport where i think the the power lifting gave me that mindset to know that i could work for something and then achieve it and that was not something that I had a lot of success. Mm. I don't know if I had any experience with doing anything like that. Certainly not school, you know, with that. And, and then parlay that. And then you learn from that, that you can work for something, go to the meet, and not achieve what you wanted. And that's all right, because you still kind of did through the training and go through there. Can you explain uh, what that first gym was like that you trained at? Can you kind of describe it to us a little bit? I remember. Like side. Well, yeah, I, guess I remember I gotta... some of the gyms I trained at when I was young, and it, it just always smelled like, it smelled ass. like sweat. Yeah, it smelled like ass. It smelled <laughs> like baby powder, and it smelled like Ben Gay. Like it was a kind of combination yeah. and chalk. Yeah, they, 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 the one thing I do know is they all kind of they all smelled even when I said like rotten wood, like rotten wood was like a. You know, normal like smell people like, train in here yeah like it's just staple, gross right? wood like your jujitsu place you go to i'm sure you no, walk in there it smells like ass and you're like, mm. wood. it just smells absolutely yeah. horrible but it, it had a power rack i mean it was small maybe 400 square a little bit like west side but people won't know what that means so 400 square foot power rack chest supported row pull down machine deadlift platform a bench incline bench and that was about it you know so just and i didn't know any different so it's i remember when i went to college it's like oh my god i went to the gym and there were fucking machines like man i that's why i body built for three years it's like i gotta use these machines because all i saw muscle and fitness and shit i'm like i do this shit make me big right <laughs> and so i'm doing i never had access to it yeah. Yeah, we had to do pull downs for people held your shoulders down because there was nowhere to hook your legs up underneath that <laughs> and wow. crazy shit like that it was just a high it was a pulley that was just attached to the wall with you know, drop down. How many of those would you sell? <laughs> yeah, exact zero. The plywood's coming out of the wall. Um, and just big weights and people lifting bigger weights. So that that was a, a benefit I didn't realize until I got older is you go in a gym and everybody's squatting five, six, seven hundred pounds. It's, to you, it's like, shit, I suck. Mm. I'm using a plate. 
you know, this is terrible. So the media, you know, it's, and the bench, you know, everybody's benching 400. So I'm like, well, shit, you know, they're old. Yeah, you know, I should be able to do this if I'm 16. I should be able to, I'm fucking young. They're old. These old fucks shouldn't be able to outlift <laughs> me. And so my perception of strength was really fucked up. But it helped. It, it was helped. it intimidating? This was place intimidating? No, no, not to me. They were, they were, um, what do I want to say? Embracing? Mm. They, they, they never made me feel that way. You know, it's they, it only a few of them only after I started out lifting them. Mm. Then I, I didn't, now I know why, cause it's just how <laughs> things work. Yeah. But man, when I started, I thought they would be happy. And when I started to get stronger, but mm. no, that was that's the rumors and you know all that bullshit that comes with that. So, <laughs> but that's when the the odd thing that happens with that is that's when the better lifters start saying, "Look, man, come over here," mm. and then you, you you start to see the the C's part, and there's this group and this group. When you first get in there, it's just one group. Mm -hmm. Then you see, okay, there's these little subgroups, and this is where I want to be. <laughs> and these guys, fuck them. You know, if they can't deal with it, too bad. You know, they are who they are. I just wanted to beat them worse at that point. And, yeah, so that, I didn't never have. At a west side barbell, you know, like let's say the entrance is like, you know, over here. And let's say this, the monolift is, is on the other side of the room. At West Side, you know, you would ne when someone was new, someone was coming in, they were visiting. You'd always see them kind of they they creep in, they'd come to the front door, and there's like kind of that area in the front where there's like a little bit of grip stuff, and there was a couple, mm -hmm. there was like a reverse hyper row, there was like a row of reverse hypers, mm -hmm. and there was a couple, there was well a million dumbbells on the ground, it's kind of scattered all over the place for some reason. They didn't have a dumb, I don't know why mm -hmm. he didn't have a dumbbell rack, but he didn't have a dumbbell mm -hmm. rack. And that's where all the new people would kind of hang out and they would kind of peer in there and they'd kind of watch, they'd watch some people squat and stuff. But like when people are squatting in there on like a Friday morning or something, mm -hmm. it, people would even be further back. They'd be like almost all the way mm -hmm. out the door. They would only like put their toe in basically just to kind of get in there. Um, West Side Barbell, I think, had a very kind of intimidating uh, feel to it. The lifters in there were huge. It mm -hmm. was It was kind of odd to see a group of lifters in there that were under 300 pounds. I mean, there was... It was big. When I got there, they were all big. Yeah, everyone was, everyone was huge. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that atmosphere was, was crazy. The music blaring, mm -hmm. people bleeding all over the place. Yeah. And it was kind of just, it was kind of just the, way, the way that it was. But you'd, you'd see somebody, they might come in there for you know, a couple days in a row. And as they came in, you know, they, would, might, they might trickle down towards the model lift mm -hmm. a little bit more. And maybe at one point they get brave enough to squat when nobody's looking. When everyone's doing their assistance work or something like that. So, Mark, I don't think you've ever said it on the podcast, but were you part of the morning or the, the, the night crew? I'd get in there. In the, well, I would actually kind of do both. I would mm -hmm. come in there in the okay. morning a lot, but I just hung out with Louie like all day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was bench days. I remember him being in there in the morning. Um, squad day, I don't remember too much, but you were traveling. So he was, right. he was uh, wrestling a lot. So I don't think... I don't think I remember you being there much on Fridays, but I don't think you were either in town on Fridays. And there was a long yeah. time that he was he was commuting from somewhere in Kentucky, yeah, right? I, I, yeah, I would com commute from Columbus to, I was going to Cincinnati for a while. They yeah. had a wrestling school there. And that wasn't that bad. Cincinnati's not mm -hmm. that far away. Mm -hmm. That place shut down. And then so the next closest place was Louisville. This is yeah. like, what, three hours or yeah. something? Yeah, it was it maybe a little more than that. Yeah. But it was a trip. So yeah. there was a commute that he had with that as well. West Side, when that was normal for me, you know, for a lot of other people to get in there, that was different, like a culture right. shock. That's my, my first gym was kind of like that. So there's a lot of shit talking and stuff <laughs> like that. So that was. That for some reason that never bothered me, so it was fine. You know, I yeah. remember my the first place I was at. I remember I, I missed a 500 pound deadlift, and I don't know how old I was. It's irrelevant. And um, the fucking guy got so mad at me. The one of the, his name was Pat. He was a police officer. He got so mad he threw my cowboy boots in the middle of the street, and it was on a busy street. And I'm like, how the fuck am I gonna get my boots out of the? It's like <laughs> fucking Frogger trying to get your my boots back. But I, at that point, I'm like, I can never fucking miss another weight in here. I'm gonna lose my shoes. You missed a lift, and he threw your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> he threw my shoes in the middle. Should have called the cops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it, was, it was fucked up. And um, but I'm like, it's kind of funny, you know, the, I was mad as fuck at the time because I didn't know if I was ever going to get them back because it was a busy street. Yeah. I'm like, God damn, these are the only shoes I have because my whole, 
I, the only time I ever wore tennis shoes all the way through high school was in a, if I was playing sports or lifting. Mm -hmm. I fucking boots is what I wore all all the time. So those pictures of you in cowboy boots? Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's all I wore. You know, is that God talking? Yeah, over there. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, yeah. That's I thought all. Thought he'd I have wore. a different voice. <laughs> and, uh, no, that's it. <laughs> so from there, then I went to Toledo and I found other gyms that are just like that because that's kind of where all the stronger lifters because they couldn't lift in commercial gyms; they get kicked out. You know, unlike today, it's accepted everywhere. And that's that's why I say I can't bitch about the old days because people forget you had to lift in basements and people's garages because nobody would let you in a gym. And if they did, it was you didn't have what you needed. The plates sucked. The racks sucked. It, it wasn't even worth going. And um, so when I got to West Side, it was like, this is perfect. You know, I was trying to decide at the time, was it going to be Black's Health World or West Side? And I just graduated, so I'm trying to figure out which direction to go. And I knew Matt and Demo very well. So that was really the main reason that I came. Yeah, and how long were you at West Side before Marky showed up? Um, I probably got there in 90. I don't know when he got there. I was commuting for a year maybe just coming up the bench, maybe squat bench. Mm. And that, so I don't, I don't know when Mark got there. 99 or something yeah. like that. I was there for a while. 2000, I was right. there for a while. So I was there before with the famed Dimmer's location, which is, that that was probably, to me it was West Side. Other mm -hmm. people, it's not going to be West Side, but that was West Side. Before that, he had a commercial gym. So when I was first going up, it was a back area mm -hmm. of his commercial gym. And then he sold that half the shit went to matt demo went to a gym called m m gym which was all the machines and that was really it and then louis took the squat racks and shit like that and put that in this god awful terrible fucking it was terrible i call it the boxer in the basement gym because there was a boxer that actually lived in the basement and i didn't know it wow. i didn't know this for like six months and i'm training there all the time I get there to open it one day, and the fucker come out of the basement, scared the shit out of me. <laughs> and but there, there, there's a whole, this is where Mike Francis trained with us was in this boxer, and wow. it was on Sullivan. And the the gym had a hole in the floor, so you could see down into the basement. I could never see the boxer down there, but yeah. <laughs> sounds terrible. That, that, yeah, so yeah this this place was terrible. It was terrible, and there was a, I think it was a clay shop that was shared the storefront. So if we deadlifted, did you hear the shit rumble on oh, the no. other side of the wall? Then he finally left there and went to Demers, so we had to move everything over there. So going into Demers, I think it was me, uh, Chuck. I'm trying to think of all the people that were there after we left, mm. you know, to go from there to where he is now. And I think it was only me, Amy, Louie, and maybe Chuck. That was it. Everybody else had already come and gone through there. So I was there the whole time through Demers. And then two years after he moved, I was, I was done. But I could never, I never found any mojo in the new place either. It just wasn't the same for me. Why do you think a lot of those lifters were um, like in trouble all the time? It seemed like there. It seemed like at West Side there was a lot of was. like uh, jailbirds. You know, there's a lot of guys like that were yeah. pretty that were pretty well known by the <laughs> yeah <they're, laughs> local police. I think I don't think there were as many as the movie dictates. Mm. You know, makes you think, or even if you were there that you think and the reason why I say that is because you didn't know what anybody did right I didn't even know some of the guys names for five years like Gritter was Gritter I didn't know who the fuck Gritter was until I needed <laughs> I knew he did HVAC and I needed a fucking air conditioner I'm like well who the who's Gritter I mean I wanted to do I want yeah how do we find his name yeah then <laughs> his I figured, number yeah his name was Jeff Adams I yeah. fucking didn't know this for like three years and then Chicken Hawk it took me forever to know who the fuck Chicken Hawk I don't even know if I can tell you Mark Mark Burroughs I think yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know. You know, we just knew people by their smelly their names. You know? <laughs> Who was that, naming that was these it. people? And Glitter? when you came in, yeah, it, well, Chuck. Chuck was a good one. So Chuck would come up with most of them. So it's like uh, uh, John. Which is great because Chuck, didn't, he didn't even talk that much. Yeah, I know. Chester, Ch John, Staff, oh, yes, John, John Stafford. Stafford yeah. yeah. And so you didn't know. And when we got there, Louis was rigorous on you, you train at 830. You get in, you train. This is what you do. You, I'm not saying we didn't fuck around, have a good time and talk, but – we weren't there very long. So if I'm getting there at 8.30 and I'm back training clients at 10.30, you're in there, you're training, and you're out. So there's not a lot of small talk, and I wasn't hanging out with a lot of the guys. Nobody really hung out with anybody that much. You came in, you did your shit, and you left. So you really didn't know what anybody did, and you didn't care. So in that environment where everybody's you know 
pissing fire and aggressive and everything else, you just assume everybody's a convict because you know a couple are. <laughs> All right, so a couple are, then, but you don't realize that, you know, Doc Dave is a fucking brain surgeon and you have all these other people in there with PhDs and master's degrees. Then you find out, you're like, no, that ain't right. <laughs> you know, you're bullshit me. Mm-hmm. And, no, really? No. And you're like, yeah, yeah, fucking guy is a, you know, accountant. Like, no, no. Fuck no. There's no way. I thought he killed people for a living. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's shit like that. And, um, but the mentality, I guess, what you could say was kind of like a convict mentality yeah. from that standpoint. Right. But, and we didn't, we weren't prejudiced against people that were out of prison <laughs> right. or were going to go back to prison. It's just, they didn't make very good training partners because they didn't stay very long. <laughs> so they would come, they were, they were good to train with, but then they just disappeared. You're like, oh, okay, where's so and so at? Well, but oh, then they okay. were teaching people in prison, so it was passing on. Yeah, until they took the weights out of the prisons. So that kind of <laughs> happened while we were through there. Well, who do you think uh, the strongest guy was that ever trained, or that you ever saw there? Chuck. There's no doubt. Mm. I mean, Matt was super, super strong. But for some reason, the only thing I can really remember of him is his demise. I can't remember so mm. much of when he was really strong, because that was only maybe a couple years while I was there, and then it just – yeah it just it faded fast but uh, i think other people had they stayed longer uh, i think joe mccoy was uh, super Mm -hmm. super strong and not taking anything away from him any any way because he went on to be a police officer and he's one of the highest ranking officers in columbus now Mm -hmm. but he he still had a lot of untapped potential rob fuzzer had a lot of untapped potential so there were other ones but chuck lasted you know, a long time. People yeah. don't realize how long that dude lasted. I mean, he was winning the Y Nationals, which was a huge, huge meet before I even got there. Mm. So this is shit before ninety. You know, mm. he had several ups and downs. You He's know, part th- of those old, old videos yeah. from back in the day, yeah. walking it, it, the weights out and everything. No yes. monolift. Yep. And when I got there, there was no monolift. Mm. You know, I remember Louis got the monolift maybe one or two years in a dimmers and squatting on the fucking jack sucked because i squatted with we squatted in little groups you know so they might have two people and you go back to back so three at the most it depends on what phase of training you're in but usually it's two people back to back and you push each other that's how long rest we had so somebody went and you sometimes you'd be pushing the fucker out of the way to get there to try to tire them out so it's kind of like a tag team thing louie and i squatted back to back for most of my time there so eight years that fucker, when we had the jacks, would not fucking increase. I had to take it out on his shit. So I'm doing a good morning to get every fucking thing <laughs> out. My back is hosed, and I'm bitching and complaining. He just says I'm weak, and it shouldn't be a problem because I'm fat and I weigh 300 pounds. Meanwhile, this is bullshit, you know, and I get mad as fuck about this because it's not right. Yeah, he's like 5'5". Five, five. Yeah, he pulled this shit with the bands, too, where... You know, extra band tension. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm standing up. He's taking it. I remember one time the monolith was like, and I'm bitching about this because it's bullshit. The mon- he took it like on the first hole, so it's all the way down. It can't get any fucking lower. And then you got to crank it like 85 times for me, and it was like nine inch difference. He's like, are oh, the bands are the same? Like you're out of your fucking mind. They're the same. This isn't even close. They're like slapping at the bottom of his, and they're like taunt at mine. And like my bottom's his top. It's almost like that. So I take these um, pulling blocks that are like this tall. Remember those white things you stand on for deficit deadlifts? So I throw them in the monolith. Stand on them, motherfucker. He threw them out, started telling me I was fat and out of shape and all this other kind of crap. But that that was Louie. That's how we got on each other's nerves. I don't know if you guys know this, but Dave, like, totally killed me. He was like, he wanted me to write on this site because he knew I was a wise ass and he knew I can talk shit. And he goes... <laughs> He totally fucked me. Like he completely screwed me. He's like, dude, it's gonna be. (laughs) He's like, it's gonna be great. He's like, he's like, fuck with people. And I was like, all right, I'll fuck. So I start messing with like people that are writing in and asking questions, and I would say stupid stuff, and it would be wouldn't be too bad. It would be. It was fine. Yeah, it would be. It'd be okay. It'd be okay. Like. I, you know, somebody would say, hey, you know, what do you do for your bench or something? And I would say, uh, hey, burpees are the best because, you know, it <laughs> helps with your lockout. And, you know, it, like burpees were always at the end of my workout. I always wrote them in there because I was just under this anonymous name, Jackass. 
And he's like, it's going to be great. He's like, you can fuck with anybody you want. And mm-hmm. then he then he pushed me to fuck with people in the gym. Mm-hmm. But I'm training in the gym. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like, nah, you know, no one will know who it is. He's like, he's like, I think a lot of the guys still they still think that it's me. And I've had other people <laughs> do it here and there. He's like, so just let her rip. And I'm like, let her rip. I was like, just, I'm like, really? Just like, go for it. Like, I can kind of dig on people. Mm-hmm. He goes, yeah, go for it. So I start digging on people. People start getting really fucking pissed. And they're like, Dave, who the... They're going, they keep going to him. He's not spilling the beans for a little while, but this goes on for maybe just a couple of months or so. And then finally he just can't take the harassment anymore and he fucking spills the beans. It was fucked up though, because this, this is, I wanted it because he was helping with the seminars. You guys don't know this. It was different training there after. (laughs) He, I was like, oh shit. He knows way more about training than what you guys think. He doesn't, you're, you're too modest about what you know about your training and way more than what that I see you talking about from a strength perspective. And so I wanted him on there for the Q and A's, but he didn't have his elite yet. So that was kind of a thing. You can't answer questions on the site till you have your elite, but we can put you on. Cause he could talk shit better than anybody <laughs> I've ever seen. It was great. I mean, in the gym, you, you did, it was fun to talk shit with him, but you were going to lose. By the way, the, when you say you're elite, do you mean it's like a certain elite total? Elite total. Yeah. Elite total. Okay. Elite total, yeah. So with that, you know, and that was awesome. You know, I loved it because if you couldn't win in person, you were going to get drilled online for sure. There's no <laughs> chance in hell. So I tell all these guys that are on the Q&A and on the site, look, Mark's going to come on there. He is going to fuck with you. That's why I'm putting him there. Oh, fine. No big deal. It's We know what's going on. It's cool. Bob Young's was the worst. I yeah. can say this now because he's passed on. Yeah. So <laughs> R.I.P. Yeah. So there we go. And so <laughs> Mark starts. And it's funny, man. I'm like reading this shit. It's cracking me up. And a month goes by and I'm starting to get emails and calls like, man, who is this fucking guy? You know, oh, you know who he is. Like, are you kidding me? We had this conversation. <laughs> well, this is going too far. And I'm reading. I'm like, no, it's not. He's just saying your shit. Yeah, they're like, well, we don't really know him, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like your squats are high. It's just stupid shit, you know? And then Bob just loses. His shit. This is bullshit. And Bob's <laughs> at West side at the time. He's all fucking mad and butthurt about it. And, mm-hmm. Now I had to tell Mark, so we, can't, we gotta dial it back, but you still have to stay jackass until you get your elite total. And if you look and go through the archives, you can see a, still all on the train, all the training that he did, from just being really a four hundred five bencher to shit, you know, pro totals and stuff. So it's there. I mean, there's yeah. the whole path. And nothing's changed. He's only gotten better at the shit talking. The second, that's good. That's the, good. The second you let your guard <laughs> down, like uh, the other day we had an awesome podcast and, you know, we, we met up afterwards. I'm like, Mark, dude, we crushed it. Dude, that was so much fun. He's like, yeah, I think so too. If you could just, uh, anytime you speak, edit that part out. And, <laughs> like, fuck. Like, just totally crushed, right? Like, I, no recovering from that. <laughs> but what was it uh, that Mark was doing that like caught your attention where you're like, dude, you need to be writing on Elite right now? He was helping with the seminars. And, oh, okay. you know, that was that was the first thing. And when people help with the seminars, I wanted people that was to help with the seminars. So if worst case scenario, I got to go take a piss and they're still teaching people what to do. I'm comfortable with whatever they're teaching what to do. And there, there was never a problem, ever a problem with that. No matter what the lift was, he was able to teach it what however it needed to be taught and that's that that's different than what you think because every ricky crane once said a long time about go there's technique form and style so there's a certain technique that's associated with every lift say textbook technique but due to people's leverages biomechanics bone structure that form is going to change a little bit you know so let's say the technique says medium wide stand squat well, now it's going to go closer because of that. Then everybody's got their style that's going to fall in there. A lot of people, when they go to teach these lifts, just find their technique and stay right there. Mm-hmm. You can't do that. You got to understand what that is and then kind of disseminate that on who you're working with and what level they're at. You can't take somebody that is just a complete disaster. That is awesome. I've never heard that yeah. before. You take Technique, somebody that's yeah. and style. I like that. That's yeah. really good for jujitsu too. Mm-hmm. Yes. It, I think it probably goes through every sport. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you can't fuck with somebody's style if it's working. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, you can't teach people beyond what they're capable of doing, you know, and that's where 
he was able to do that where some other people I was having help before that could not do that. And it becomes a problem when you're trying to teach somebody and you only have one day because you want them to have a takeaway when they leave that day and not think, shit, I, I, I don't, I'll, no, I'll never squat. I don't know how to squat. You got to get them to squat the best they can and tell them, look, there's still a lot of distance for you to go, but here's just stay here. You know, kind of meet them where they're at type yeah. of thing. And that's a little different skill set that is required that I think you can really only get if you've been through several different disciplines or different gyms to be able to, to see that because you can get handcuffed into one technique or one style based upon only being in one place your whole life. So it's like, okay, this is the place where this isn't a dig on West side, but this is the place where you got to squat wide, sit back, make sure your, your mm -hmm. knee is over the heel at all times. And that's the gospel. Yeah. You know, it, Maybe for everybody, or maybe maybe not for everybody, yeah. you know. On that note, I'm, I'm curious about this because you mentioned that you have a degree and you, I'm guessing you also have maybe have some certifications or something, mm -hmm. but um, nowadays you'll see a lot of people getting online, they'll start sharing content, they'll start working with people. Um, and, and a lot of people don't bother getting degrees, they, they, they self-educate. So what is your feelings on that? Because from what you said, you know, um, get yourself in, get yourself having different experiences with different coaches, learn from people. How should people go about that? And do you have a bias towards getting a degree or anything like that? Now we're getting into a different conversation now mm. because now the question is going to become, is the degree worth the investment? Mm. Especially mm. when you're talking an exercise science program or something of that nature. Because if, if somebody is going to come out of college $100,000 in debt, for a profession that they might only make 20 or 30,000 at, that's a different conversation. So if we remove that, mm. because I can say that $100,000 in debt isn't worth the education you're gonna get now. You can self-educate, go to seminars and find mentors that are gonna make you way better than that and not be strapped in debt for the next 30 years of your life and maybe ever to be able to pay it back. Yeah. When I went, when it was affordable and you could go and work and pay your way through college, 100% a degree is necessary because not so much the education from the exercise science degree, but learning how to learn is the biggest thing that I took from college is just the word research. Okay. People use that now and they think that's a Google search. And I tell them, well, Google search the word research because that's not a Google search. So the, the biggest thing that I don't like about the education system all the way down into junior high is nobody's teaching these kids how to actually use Google and to search and vet content. So there's an oversaturation of content. Everybody agrees to that. I don't think it's that hard if you're somewhat educated to be able to vet through the content you're looking at. But who's teaching these kids how to do that? They're not. Is it happening in college? No. So there, there's that. So remove that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, yes, I think that it's important for somebody to learn basic biomechanics, to learn uh, nutritional biochemistry, to learn anatomy, physiology to at least have the surface of all those things because it will create a bullshit detector because there is a lot of bullshit. There's a lot of stuff that's unique and, and trend and has some validity, but there's a lot that doesn't. And if you just have a basic understanding of how nutrients process and digest throughout the system, that's going to eliminate 70% of the bullshit immediately or biomechanics if you have a basic understanding of that and then you start looking at how some people are teaching form technique and all the other stuff and you start to see oh wait wait something's not right you may not know what's not right but you have that gut feeling this isn't right and you know where to go look that's the value of that the um but i think that now can probably be taught online the experience part, 
that's still necessary if it's a degree or non-degree you still have to i think you still have to train people face to face in person before you can ever think about training them online because when you train somebody in person you have nonverbal communication you have you know gut feelings you have all this other and verbal communication you have all this stuff that you can drive off of and see and regulate their program when you train somebody online every nonverbal aspect is completely removed every verbal aspect is completely removed and you're left with the worst form of communication known to man email or text which is even worse and you're going to use that to regulate somebody's training the only way I see that working is if you have thousands of hours of training people in person and you find the trends like this follows this follows this follows this and then it's like okay I got that and then you kind of go from there you don't need a degree for that that's just finding people to work under intern under and experience I mean, ultimately, you just need a, a product to sell in some way, right? So mm-hmm. uh, we were talking earlier about, you know, margins and stuff like that. And it's only it's only going to be worth what the market will pay for it. Well, yourself is the same. You know, if you're yes. selling programming, um, you may not need to go to college. But if you're further educated or you figured out a way to educate yourself by either, you know, throwing yourself into the gauntlet of like trying to be a pro bodybuilder or, you know, trying to kill yourself doing powerlifting or just going to school or whatever way you did it, it really doesn't matter if you have a good product to sell and a very clear message, uh, then that will uh, probably have a pretty good market value. So as long as you, mm-hmm. as long as you're not full of shit and you're able mm-hmm. to, you know, uh, have some great information, then should be, you should be on your way really. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree that you have to have that. And it has to be a realistic market. Your key word there is market value not what somebody thinks their personal value. They should worry that, you know, they should have a high personal value in it, but they have yeah. to understand that's not the market value. They're completely different things. Yeah, and then just to even simplify it, Mark and I were actually talking about this the other day. Um, you know, as a photographer, I don't have a degree, whereas the next kid might be busting his ass to get that degree. But if we both take a photo, of, we'll just say the same thing, and mine just looks better, people are not gonna give a shit about a no. degree. I'm still going to get the job. So mm-hmm. within SEMA's training, he's, he can show that he knows what he's talking about and he's going to show results. And then so nobody's going to care about a degree at that point. I don't think, well, I'm an employer, but I can only speak as one employer. Mm-hmm. It depends upon what the position is. The last thing I look at on any resume is going to be the degree. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm looking at the experience or usually it's who they know or what's coming through in the interview because regard they still have to learn what we do, you know, and then bring something to the table that we don't have to be able to help with that. And the, the degree is really in, in my mind now it's, it's, it's irrelevant, but it depends upon what the skill is. Some skills, it guarantees they're going to have the minimum skill set where sometimes you don't know that, you know, they can say they have it, then they get here and say, oh, they don't have it. How do you so, end up with a team and a culture that, that you want, you know, because you've been doing this for a long time. So you must have learned, you know, a lot of lessons over the years of, you know, hiring friends or a buddy's buddy or, or yeah. those, those kinds of things. How do you end up with a good, strong team? Um, I don't have that figured out. You know, I have a really weird leadership ability. It's like non-leadership. But I think that what here's what I know. Let's put it that way. I know what the vision of the company is. I know what that is, and I know what that path is, and it's unfortunately it's a non-profitable path. It, it, it it's it's passing it's everything that we've talked about. Mm-hmm. You know that's what it is. So it's not a value opportunity mm-hmm. proposition, but but that, that's that's okay. It's 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 what it is. So I know what that is. So it's a matter of how does everybody kind of fit into that, and if they fit into that, good and it's exactly what we want if they don't fit into that then they they won't stay and the the culture is it's not a culture that we really foster it's it's not like here's what our culture is here's a b c d whatever it is we have people that have been here for 10 years and other ones that haven't and if, if they're in a certain position they're given a lot there's some things that 
Tracy runs the the office. So, so there's some things that she's really strict on that I don't know if she should really be strict on, but I'm not crossing that. We have separate. That's her thing, yeah. Yeah, we have separate things, but that's helped develop the culture. But the one thing that we're very, very flexible on is the ability. I want the creativity of the job that they're doing to be maximized with what their skill set is. So if it's Josh with video, you know, I can't tell him how, I don't know shit about video, but I don't want his creativity to be stifled. You know, I want to see what that that is and him to push that in ways that he can push it that still kind of has to do with the company. You know, he'll do, you know, projects that are contract process projects on the side, but he can do whatever he wants from that standpoint. So if it's a podcast, you want to do a podcast, fine. If I have an idea of a different podcast, I'll run it through him. We'll discuss it. And ultimately he's going to be the one that's going to just say yes or no, because he's going to be the one doing the majority of the work for that. Um, if it's the editorial, you know, article standpoint, you know, do however they got to do it. I just watch the main indicators. You know, I look at the big, the big rocks, traffic, stuff like that, and make sure that's going where it needs to go. You know, to me, site traffic's the most important thing, not social media, nothing. It's the site traffic. That's, everything's a click away from the store. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately it's still a business. We can't give anything away. We can't give any content away. We can't put any articles out. We can't do any podcasts. We can't do any of this unless we have customers. So it, the customers provide all the content, not us. Without them, there's nothing. So how many clicks away are they from the store? You know, an article's a one click away. It's right there. Um, Instagram's the swipe. So it, it depends. It's faster because it's mm -hmm. a swipe, but they have to get to that story. So it's really a little bit further away. Facebook's a little bit closer than Instagram because it's a click away. It's an article, it's a click away. YouTube's tricky because it's really hard to get from YouTube to a site. So that's tricky. So it's what can you put on YouTube that can come back to the site as a blog or an article or go to these other, like a podcast goes everywhere, right? 10, 15 places. I people need to be really careful with this kind of stuff. I think people spend a lot of time on Instagram and I think that they maybe are not realizing that they're actually working for Instagram. Yes. You know, they say that they're a content creator and I look at that and I'm like, man, that, that people have a kind of a misunderstanding of the fact that they're creating content for Instagram. Yes. And it's uh, it's it can be a trap in some ways. Not that you have to monetize everything either. I'm not saying no, no, that. No, no, no. But you you do need to figure out a way to monetize a, a, you know a good amount yeah. of your. You time. You got to watch your time too, right. because the average person spends an hour a day on Instagram. That's the average person. So the people that you see posting a lot, you know, that's over there. Look at your own screen time right. on your phone. And last year I was pushing hard on Instagram. I wanted to answer every DM. There's a lot of DMs. You know, I was three hours a day on that thing. So it, 27, 30 hours a week, and most of that time's answering DMs. And it makes, you're, you're close to the, you're close. It's a it's personal nice, contact. Yeah. It's, it's a really good thing. But 30 hours, you know, that's a full-time job. That's, that's a lot. And it wasn't monetizing as a full-time job. So and at that point, you got to start asking yourself if you are a content creator, if if you're trying to help the maximum number of people, you're helping that one person with that one DM, but who else is seeing that? Originally, that's why I had a and a is because I was answering so many emails and this one person gets that answer. It's personal, it's great, but there's a hundred other people that want to know what that answer is too. So actually the questions, sure? the questions came from you, didn't they? Originally? No, no, <laughs> well, no, actually, no, it was Jason Burnell because it was on Deep Squad. Yeah, Deep Squad. Yeah, so he had all these West Side type questions I'd answer, and he'd have to HTML, which is code to put it on the site. It took forever to be able to do that shit. Um, and I couldn't spell for shit either, so he had to try to fix as much as yeah, he could on that's that. That's where I started reading about all this stuff in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's a website called DeepSquatter.com, and then I would see that he would write something, and it would say something about, like, blue bands. Like, what does that mean? Yeah. What does it mean? Like, what is a squat with blue? I did, couldn't picture it. I was like, I don't understand what the blue bands are. And then I saw more articles mm -hmm. from me, obviously, and started figuring out. Yeah, speaking of stuff that, like, is hard to understand, from what I understand, Louis Simmons almost speaks his own language. But you were one of the few that yeah. could, like, decode what he was saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what, what did you learn from the way he taught you that you, like, have implemented? Everything. Yeah. Everything. I mean, I, I knew a lot about power living before Louis, but... I, I didn't know what I, what I thought I did, yeah. you know, not, not even close. So 
the the things that I'm starting to see that I do now with these little groups like I had earlier today is because they're they're filming this stuff so there's a lot of stuff that you kind of do automatically that you don't know that you're doing that is valuable to other people and you now I'm seeing what a lot of that is and I'm trying to figure out how to teach that to other people and that's reading nonverbal. It's how do you auto regulate if somebody you're squatting with somebody and that you know it just doesn't look right. So you're saying, look, man, you're you're telling them to do this, do this, back down. Or maybe they need a kick of the ass. You know, you got to kind of know how do you know that? You know, you just know it because you've been doing it for 40 years or 30 or whatever it is. And how do you tell somebody else to see what you see? And that's a lot of what I got from Louis because when you're in there, he's telling you, look at this, look at Chuck, see what he's doing. See why? Why is he doing that? You know why he's doing that? And he's just pounding and pounding and pounding. And it was everybody that was in there. We were taught to coach, not taught to lift. That way, when somebody was squatting, it wasn't just Louie helping them. It was the seven other people that are also watching. So every lifter had everybody else as a coach. So what you end up with is some of them are gonna are gonna embrace that. You know, I was one, AJ was one, you know, winning was kind of one. There's people that are going to embrace that type of thing to learn because it's what we love to do. Other ones are just doing it because it's part of the culture, the atmosphere, what it is, and it's how you become better. And so some of us were able to disseminate, decode better because we were teaching people that were outside of the gym. We're in the in the gym. It's just like, hey, you know, stop doing that shit, and you know what they're doing. You, the, the connection's right there. Like, quit that shit, and they know exactly what they're doing. You know, now in real life, it's like, you know, look, the way you're holding your chin, you need to talk or whatever it's going to be to do that. So he was a master at that. You know, he was a master manipulator too, which pissed me off. But he was a master at that. You know, teaching you how to coach. That that was the biggest thing is learning those. The, the program stuff is kind of easy. For me, it's kind of easy to figure that out, you know, and to break it down. It was kind of rare from what I remember for him to actually coach you. Like he would, mm-hmm. like you said, he would point to someone else as they were going and he he would point out things. Yes. And he he did that often. And I always, I always really liked that. And then when I opened up my own gym and was working with people and having groups come in, like people would just keep looking at me when they were doing their lift and they're kind of like looking to me to you know, explain stuff to them. And I'm like, that's not, I don't Mm -hmm. really coach that way. I need to see you lift a couple times. And we're going to use an example of the people that are doing shit right. And I'm going to point to those people and point them out. Very similar to what, you know, Louie had us do. And there were people that went and listened to him. So those would be the people that would, hey, Dave, go tell Chuck this, you know, and then (laughs) there would always be somebody that somebody else would listen to. Or maybe it was me, (laughs) you know, you know, Chuck, go fucking tell Dave to do this. The communication in there would get quite complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of times where you just it's it's like a family, you know, a fucking very dysfunctional, (laughs) fucked up family. But it's like a family to where you might not. You don't have to like people you train with. And this is different today because there's a lot more places to train. So if you wanted to power lift in Columbus today, there's probably 50 places to go. Where back then there was maybe three, maybe. Mm-hmm. All right. So, yes, you had to train with people you didn't like. That was just part of it. I grew up with that. Do I miss that? A little bit. Because I think that teaches people how to get along with people that are not like themselves. And now when you can just leave and go train with a bunch of people that you like all the time, I, I don't know how that really goes on to impact how you are as, you know, father, family, business, and so forth. Because you have to deal with people you don't like. It's just life. You know, it's how it is. Yeah. Who had to, uh, to who was the messenger for Mark? Like, who did, who did you have to tell, like, dude, some, to tell Smelly he needs to there quit? Wasn't, there wasn't a lot because <laughs> yeah. it was... Like I said, I don't really only remember the bench, you know, and mm-hmm. his fucking bench was strong. I mean, it was one of those things like this little fucker's strong, man. Look at his right. bench is fucking, his floor press was fucking strong. You know, mm-hmm. the little fucker come in, he's not that big. <laughs> you know, at the time he's not that big. And the little fucker's floor pressing like four, you can't say shit because it's almost, it's like what you're doing or more than what you're doing. So you can't say shit about it. The fucker weighs 50 pounds less and he's doing more. And he could fucker could bench, you know, later you discovery can fucking squat and deadlift too but the the bench was a, so there wasn't a lot with because the bench is a little easier it's just kenny and george you know just kind of took over that whole thing and 
What, what was how, how was Louis a master uh, manipulator? Like, what were, what were some things he saw? Yeah, I don't even know if it was necessary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think some of it was, I, I can't really answer because he'd have to answer that because I don't know what the, I don't know what his intent was. I just know that, you know, stu like when I came into the gym, it was, I, I guess you could say I was the first one to be recruited into Westside. And when I came in, Waddle was told, you know, Dave's coming in to beat you. You know, and he was a 308 and I was 275. As soon as I got there, I had gained weight. And so Tom fucking hates me, you know, because, and I'm like, what the fuck? And I have to train with this dude in the afternoon when I got there. So this yeah, he'd make shit up. Yeah, yeah. And he, all the time, you know, and <laughs> come in, I would come in and say, you know what Rob was saying about you? I'm like, oh my God, what? And it's, it's, <laughs> Mark then, does that shit. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So he'd make that shit up. And then Rob comes in, you look, you want to fucking punch him in the face? <laughs> And then, you know, after training, you're like, dude, why in the fuck did you say that? It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then it's like, I didn't ever say that. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, I thought, you know, stupid shit like that all the time. And so I don't know what the point of that was, except just to maybe make Louie laugh when he went home by himself. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. But other times it was more along the lines of um, threatening to throw people out. So it's like, tell so-and-so that if they don't get their shit together, they're fucking out. I mean, why do I have to tell them? Why don't you tell them? Why do I have to do this? You know, because he's your fucking training partner. Yeah. And, you know, at the time, it took me a few years before I said, what, you're just too coward to do it yourself? It, I don't want to do that. To be, I don't want to get my ass thrown out. And so that, that, that was where things got fucked up because you didn't <laughs> know if it was for real or if it was just to fuck with the person. Because if I'm going to be the bearer of bad news and it's not for real, I don't want to do this because I got to train with the asshole for another three years. and I already don't like him in the first place. <laughs> so if, if this is for real, like he needs to get the shit together and, and not bomb out of the next meter, he's gone, then stand by that decision or I'm not going to say it. But shit like that was a lot too, where it was, those were the more unpleasant <laughs> things. Do you think the actual method mattered or could we have been doing anything in there because of the environment and the culture? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I paused and had to think about it because it really doesn't matter how much. Like, how much. Uh, yeah, how much. I, I still, it? because gear, gear's a weird thing. And when we, we were in there during a real weird time with gear, and you went back to California before things started to kind of settle out a little bit because we just put the shit on when we went to a meet. So if you had a bench shirt, you kind of have to learn how to use the bench shirt. We didn't do that. We just trained raw. This is a big, giant misconception with Westside, by the way. We trained raw all the fucking time. The only time we put the bench shirt on was a meet. I didn't even know if the fucking thing fit. I would try it on the Wednesday before the meet. The, okay, this is good. And then go. Squat suit the same way. The, we never used wraps. We still didn't use wraps in a meet or in the gym ever. No baby powder, no wraps, none of that shit. The only thing we would use is briefs and for dynamic day. Max effort day, you didn't wear shit. Most of the time, you didn't wear a belt. And if you did, people were going to bust your balls for wearing a belt. Wow. So it was just it's straight up raw, I guess you could call it, till the meet. Yeah, good mornings and, with the safety squat bar yes. feel amazing with the, <laughs> no belt. So the my pause is how much better would I have been had I known how to use my shirt and suit? Because if I'm just putting this canvas diaper thing on and the only time I ever put it on was at a meet and squatted 940 and now people three four years later were squatting 1100 1050 and so forth and I know I was stronger training with them in the gym I'm not saying I could have squatted the 1050 or 11 I'm not saying that maybe I could have I don't fucking know because we never trained in the shit so that's where I don't know because people like yourself leave and other people will leave and people in other gyms, big iron and stuff like that. They're all moving monstrous numbers and they're using their shit. And we're all kind of looking around like, what the fuck, you know, how are they getting 350 pounds out of a bench shirt? And I'm getting 40. This is stupid as fuck. You know, what are we not doing right? And that changed after I left. So I can't, I don't know how they're really implementing that into the training, but based upon Hoff, it's implemented for correctly because the dude's a freaking beast. So 
that I think could have been better when I was there. I think Jock could have been way stronger because he, we we're all the same. So he was going to meet throwing the shit on too. Mm. Um, and he would probably tell you the same is what I am that. Maybe you know, his upper body would have stayed healthier yeah, and stuff yeah. like that too. So I'm not going to be the person to say that Louie held us back because of that. I'm not going to say that, but that is something I ask, you know, is could I have been better with more experience in the gear if the training was designed? This is, listen to what I'm going to say here. Could I have been better in the gear if the training was designed for gear? Mm-hmm. Now, isn't that contradicting everything people say about Wes? Right. Yeah. Okay. This is from somebody that was fucking there that whole for 14 years. That's the biggest, biggest question I have about the west side method well i told louie one time i said hey i went to, just so you know i went from 903 to 1080 squat and you said you're full shit and <laughs> and uh yeah well so what he said was and i told him kind of how i did it i said here's how i did it. i did box squats i kind of used a version of your circa max stuff that you that you laid out in the past and uh i kind of created my own version of it but i did it with my straps i did it with briefs on and my suit and the straps up and he was always against like the straps mm-hmm. up and you certainly would never wear a squat suit and squat to a box. Was that on a box with yeah, the straps up? Yeah, okay. I would squat onto a box. And he was like, well, he's like, that's the wrong way to do it. And I said, uh, Louis, I'm going to tell you again. I went from <laughs> a 903-pound squat to a 1,080 squat, you know. And I was doing similar stuff in the bench shirt and stuff too. I would, mm-hmm. you know, I wear the bench shirt and have bands on there and chains on there and stuff. But I think that. You know, somewhere along the lines, he, he, he knew what he knew, right? And mm-hmm. then sometimes you maybe start to get kind of closed off to, like, new ideas or concepts. And so maybe he just didn't want to – Yeah. he didn't want to hear it. He wanted to kind of try his, his own stuff out. Yeah, okay. it could be. And how come we don't hear more about that? Is it because it's West Side and people don't want to, you know, badmouth it or whatever you want to I, – I think there's a couple of reasons is Louis, Louis knows his shit. Mm-hmm. I've, I've spoken to – maybe a thousand strength coaches, you know, and a lot of really reputable ones. There's, there's very few that I would put in the same. I would say Louis is a fucking genius when it comes to this stuff. He figures shit out that people just don't think about. And I think with that comes a level of arrogance is a bad, it's what I want to say, but it's not, the word I want to say Mm -hmm. where I would not expect him to, to be anything different to where if you're a a master of certain Kung Fu discipline, okay, then you're the master of that discipline. You're going to think all other disciplines suck and that this is the only discipline that's really the best. You should think that if you're the master of that discipline, where if Mm -hmm. you're Ken Leisner with hit training, there's nothing better than hit training. And if you're learning from these people, you should understand the bias is strong. It's really strong. So just know it for what it is and don't fault the person for that because it's taken 50, 60 years for that to be developed. If you're looking at that as an outsider looking in, you can see faults in that because you see that there's more than one way. You know, if you talk to Louie, there's one way. That's it. There's one way and everything else is wrong. And his way is the right way. There's other people that say that too. You know, Ken Leisner would have been one and, right. you know, others. So, and that's, they should, they should believe in that, that hard. So if you're going to be the master of your own discipline, then be the master of that discipline. But my view on it is understand those disciplines and cherry pick from everything and be the master of none except the person that you're trying to help in front of you okay and you won't be known for a specific methodology you you see what i'm saying so i can't fault him for that because that would be the same as faulting the master of any discipline and with genius comes arrogance and should i'm not a genius so i have to work with what i have you know and the only concern the only thing that that i want is the best for the person that I'm wor- working with. Now the genius is going to think, give me that person and I'll make them better. And could they maybe probably, you know, that that's the, the argument of 
anybody that wants to criticize what Louie does, and they're a trainer as well, here's the deal. Trade athletes. So you take one of his multi-ply guys into your gym and get them ready for a meet better than he can, and he'll take one of your sprinters or whoever it is, give it to him, let him get them ready for the next meet, and let's see who comes out on top. You know, what's that multiply going to do with six months training with this guy? Vice versa. Who's going to have the greater results? I know the answer, <laughs> right? So <laughs> that has to be understood. So it's a complicated answer that I'm providing, but it's the only way I know how to provide it. Being like more open-minded nowadays to the fact that there's, even though you have a bias towards the conjugate system, uh, when you look back at old articles from yourself, mm -hmm. do you kind of think like, ah, eh, like, I don't even know if that's right anymore. Um, or you still feel strong and powerful about it? No, I'm still very biased with, <laughs> very, very biased with conjugate. And I was always careful from the very beginning to never write in absolutes because I always knew there's more than one way. So I can't look back on anything that I wrote and say that it's not right because I never wrote it in a tone that was absolute and made it right, even though places I was writing for was telling me to do that. What about something like the periodization Bible where you had examples of periodization? I think people followed that and they messed up, but you were trying to show it's an example of what not to do. Oh, the linear? Yeah. yeah. With that, I could go back and write a second part to tell you how to overcome each one of the objections I have with it. Mm -hmm. So that article was penned and written in a way to show all the shortcomings of that with the answer being conjugate. What I didn't show was a nonlinear model, an undulating model mm -hmm. or a model or a block type of model, which is still kind of linear the way that it's structured and set up. So I didn't show those where I could have mm -hmm. to where if, you know, I have, Mason's an intern now that I have that's just strength and conditioning when I go through with them I teach them linear then I teach them block then I teach them conjugate and then I will teach them you know how to break down the training days and all the other stuff and then we'll start looking at different programs like here's 531 what is that is it block is it linear is it conjugate you know here's um, the cube method what is that you know here's this what is that here's Charlie Francis and stuff what is that because I think any strength coach should be able to to disseminate because there's really only so many models right. there's block conjugate linear and bodybuilding hit you know that's really about it and look at a program and see it laid out over a period of six months and say that's this that's this and every periodized model has shortcomings so conjugate has shortcomings they all do so you have to know the shortcomings and know how to overcome those bodybuilding is a little bit different because the room for air in the weight room is giant so you can screw up a lot the room for air in the diet is not that's very very thin where strength training the room for air and training is very thin the room for diet's huge you eat pretty much whatever the fuck you want and get strong the only factor that limits that is you start to get older it starts to become a little more important you know what you're doing with that or if weight classes you have to be more conscious of the nutritional density of the food that you're putting in so did mean, that answer the question? It did. <laughs> what are, what's something that you learned, uh, like, not to do by kind of seeing Louie over the years? I, I want to say overreaching because we did a lot of dumb shit, you know, that he would tell us not to do, but he still was an enabler. So a lot of times I think he was telling you not to do it so you would do it. But just the dumb shit, like um, – you miss a weight, you get pissed, you know, and you, you, mm. it comes a little bit with the mindset though, too, where if you had a bad training session, you're pissed about that for a week, you can't get it the fuck out of your head. So you never wanted to, I never wanted to leave with that because I didn't want to spend the next week with myself. Mm. It's, I, ugh, fuck that. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that's where shit ended up where, people would find your buttons 
And it's like, oh, man, Dave gets pissed when this kind of shit happens. So it just has, so fuck it. Zippy. Yeah, get on his ass, you know. And that's where I started alter, to learn. Alter yeah, ego. that's where I started to learn that I have three Zippy cards I can play in a day, and that's it. After that, I'm shot. I'm dead. And in a meet, you're fucked because <laughs> I only got three Zippy cards to play. <laughs> and so I got to, what attempt is this going to happen on? Because if it's going to happen on an opener, I'm fucked. I'll get three squats, and the rest of the meet's going to suck. And... um but they would find that, you know, they, they found that in the gym pretty fast. And it's like, oh, fuck, Zippy's funny as fuck. Let's get him. A, you bash your head bleeding all over the place. But after that, you're not really worth a fuck. Yeah. So the squats <laughs> went well, but shit, your supplementals, you're laying on the floor still trying to catch your breath and puking for the next 35 minutes and do some reverse hypers and leave. That, that I think, was that learning the ability to, to pull back but I had to learn the ability with the people that I'm helping on how to actually get them to pull back where I think Louie just said, eh, don't do that shit. And then you went and did it, you know, and now he bitches and complains cause he's got a bunch of people that won't do that shit. I'm like, but their way stronger. So, you know, what's, what's the thing there? So it, it is hard. It's, it's, this is one of those back then thing back then. It seemed like you had to find a way to pull everybody back. Where now it's like you have to find a way to kick everybody in the ass to be, and that's just I know what I'm doing when I say that. I know I'm being that fucking old guy. That's just the same way probably Pacifico was with us. You know, it's just it's the same thing. And it just how can you bitch when they're stronger? Right. You can't. You know, you can't say they're stronger because they didn't work as hard. <laughs> you can't, that's, it can't be true, right? It can't be, but maybe it is. I don't know. One thing I'm curious about is. Um, one thing I noticed with like yourself and Mark is you guys both have a massive air of curiosity. And when I say that, it's like Mark used to ask me shit a few years ago. And I was like, oh shit, Mark Bell's asking me questions. But I look back at that nowadays. I'm like, Mark probably already knew what the fuck he want, like what his thoughts were on that. And he was asking me, a young guy who was just getting into this stuff, some questions. And I uh, like now I don't like I get that he's curious, but it seems like when you guys were working with Louis, Louis had a way he did things. And it seems that you both have a massive ability to pivot and just do new stuff. Just like, you know, you're you're doing podcasting, all this different social media stuff. A lot of guys aren't able to pivot in that sense. They're not able to learn all mm -hmm. of those new things. Where does that come from for you guys? Well, if you're... I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit for him, but when, when you grow up, the person that is stifled in the opinion... And then you're around people that are making all the opinions for you. And you get to a point where you're like, you know what? Fuck that shit. You know, you cross that barrier, whatever created that cross. Then when you're working or training under somebody that doesn't pivot, you, you, you're not going to do the same, you know, because all you saw that whole time was all the pivots you wanted to make, but you couldn't make. So then when you kind of get out from that, then you want to know what those are. Like, what were those things? So if I'm speaking to a lifter that's coming up, I want to know what they're doing because it's, it's obvious if it's working or not. You can see by looking at them or what their numbers are. So you can't say that's not working. There's, there's, yes, there are genetic freaks, but they still have to train. I know nobody that gets strong as fuck just eating protein bars and drinking shakes and even taking drugs. If they don't train, they're not going to lift shit. They're not going to do anything. So they're still, even with the outliers, they still have to do something. I want to know what the hell it is. Cause if it's different, then you can share it to somebody else. So he may be asking you things that he knows the answer to, and you may actually give him the answer that he knows you're going to give, but maybe you give it in a different way because he's going to be asked like myself thousands of times the same question and there's a lot of times you give the answer and you can tell from the person you're giving the answer to it didn't click so you need to know how can you say the same thing in a different way and you just told him a different way so he's sucking you dry of all your information to go to use for himself <laughs> because th yeah. it does happen there's a lot of times where you're trying to explain things and you go one two three four times and it still isn't clicking mm -hmm. and you need you need more ammo like what the hell i need something else because this shit ain't working anymore and especially been doing this for a long time because what you were telling people 15 years ago isn't going to work today you, it's it's the same thing it's the same answer but it has to be given a little differently it, or the messenger has to change 
Louis did this, right? He had other people say, you know, tell Chuck this, tell Dave this, the wrong messenger, right message. So it's, and he'll tell you straight up that with, he needed AJ for that reason, because that, that gap became too big between Louis and the age of the lifters he was working with. He wasn't able to communicate that message. And AJ was able to step in and be able to decipher that message to the people there. And it's kind of a version that's the same thing in a microcosm way. I like to ask a lot of people questions uh, for a lot of reasons. I'm n number one is what you pointed out right there. It's just selfish reasons, you know, it's like curiosity and then I'm able to maybe articulate something uh, to someone in a different way. Um, I always like to learn, you know, I was kind of uh, at a young age, I guess you, 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 you use the word stifled. I was kind of stifled into thinking that I couldn't learn stuff. And as I got older, once I recognized that that really wasn't true, I was like, wow, this is actually great. Like this makes <laughs> me feel really good to be able to learn. I didn't even know I had this capability. Mm -hmm. So to have that ability and to know that we all possess it, everyone possesses it. It's something that you could just, you could work on, you could build up. Some people are maybe, maybe they can retain more information than someone else. But another reason why I do it is I like to, I like to show people that they know a lot more than they think. Cause I think that everyone knows what to do. I really do. Yeah, I, I really do. I mm -hmm. think that people know what to do. I think even before we had communication, I think that people even, I think people knew what to do and what not to do to each other. Mm -hmm. I really think they do. I, I think, believe you. No, you know, they didn't have maybe they maybe didn't have a Bible to read, right? I mean, just think mm -hmm. way back. You know, they didn't have a Bible to read. Maybe maybe before we even knew how to like talk, you know, or maybe there's some other communication. But I, I think that people know like it's not right to like just pick up a rock randomly and throw it at someone's head. Yeah. You know, I think people know they have a lot of answers, and I think that human beings, if you think about. From a survival standpoint, I mean, we knew that we needed to procreate. Uh, we knew that we needed to eat. And you just come up with solutions for that. Like, oh, I need to eat. So I'm going to figure out how to catch a fish or I'm going to figure out how to kill something. And trying to kill something with your bare hands doesn't work great. So you're like, I'm going to figure out, a, I'm going to try to have a better solution to that. So I'm going to make something sharp. And I'm going to go fucking stab something with it, you know. But I think that, I think it's, it's, it's in you already. The answers are, they're there. And I think anybody that's listening to this and they want to know how to squat or bench or deadlift, I mean, the answers, they're, they're in you more so than they're in us. You're asking the wrong person. You should be interviewing yourself. You should be asking yourself a lot of these questions. How do I, how do I fix my lockout on my bench? You, there's no way that you don't know 10 ways to do that already. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's almost impossible, especially if you're asking, if you're asking something that specific, well, that means that, you know, uh, the general basis of, of everything else that goes into like a bench press or at least some of it. And so you should have an idea of like, oh yeah, I wonder if I just worked that range of mo like, who's the first person to like do a shortened range of motion bench press. <laughs> Somebody was like, I get stuck right here. So I'm going to try to like push through right there or somebody who figured out like massage therapy or something like oh my forearm hurts right here so i'm gonna that rub spot it. fucking hurts i'm gonna rub it on a tree or yeah, something or yeah. rub it with a goddamn yeah. rock or something right yeah my dick is really hard yeah i'm gonna put it into something <laughs> what was the catalyst because you said that you know like myself for a long time you didn't think that you could learn there was something that was a catalyst to where you realized you could what was that it was you. It was me. It was you. How was that me? A lot of it has to do with you. Uh, going to your seminars, you know. Um, you know, my wife. Uh, my my wife uh, got in communication with you somehow. I forget how, but uh, I think so. I, I forget how this all worked out. But anyway, we ended up with some tapes. Some of your old tapes. I think they're cassette tape or uh, VHS <laughs> tapes, rather, and. Uh, I watched a lot of those videos and I started to learn and absorb some of that. Um, but then like for my birthday or something, she got me a seminar to go to West Side Barbell. I went to West Side Barbell, the old place with the, where they try, where Louis tried to paint the, uh, the front, windows. front yeah. window black yeah. but it turned purple because the sunlight <laughs> would come through. So you're like, why does this badass place have a purple <laughs> window in it? And uh, you know, one day was in a classroom and another day was at West Side Barbell where you taught us like how to squat. You taught us a lot of the methods. And I was confused by even a lot of the West Side stuff because Louis, his message is great. 
He has a lot of amazing information, and I don't really think he's that confusing, but he says different stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's because he's getting asked different questions, and he probably has different beliefs at different times, depending on what year you ask him, right? <laughs> yes. He might say 35% in one article and, you yeah, know, what hour? 50%. Mm -hmm. in another. I mean, I don't know how many times he said different percentages and stuff. So I was like, man, I can't make any sense of any of this. But when you started writing, and when I read the periodization Bible part one and part two, and when I I mean, these are th like, I haven't read a lot of stuff. So mm -hmm. you got to think periodization Bible part one and part two is a lot of reading for me <laughs> because I, I have out of all the pages of stuff I've ever read that probably represents like 80% of anything I've ever read. Cause I have not read a lot of stuff in my life. So a lot of it has to do with you. And a lot of it has to do with going to that seminar where I started like piecing stuff together. And when you started explaining the conjugate system, uh, it was maybe like the matrix, you know, where the guy's like, ah, Oh, I get it. And then he wanted to learn jujitsu and he wanted to learn all these other things. And it was like implanted into his brain. Everything made sense to me. Bodybuilding made sense to me. Um, strong man made sense, sense to me. All the power lifters I've seen in the past, all that stuff made sense to me. I, it was like, uh, it really opened up my eyes and I was like, holy shit. And then from there I became completely obsessed with it. Probably like yourself, like it didn't matter if I was taking a shit or watching TV. It didn't matter where I was or what I was doing. I was thinking about a squat or thinking about how to get better on the bench or thinking about how to get better on a deadlift. And even just like something as like as funny as getting up off the toilet. I didn't do that slowly either. Oh, you know, like, boom. Yeah. You fucking explode. Yeah. Yeah. You sit back. Yeah. You, you, you go, th you rehearse it all because you're want to practice it all the time. And so I just became, you know, Louis Simmons, like obviously he was a huge, like idol of mine, a role model to me, a mentor to me in a lot of ways. But seeing your stuff made me have a much better understanding of it all, and it made me completely obsessed with it all. Hmm. People wonder why I do this. So it's your fucking fault. <laughs> it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. No, it's bad. No, it's not a no, bad, bad thing. I can't stop if thinking about it. you go on and help thousands of people. <laughs> no, no. It's, you know, it's going back to what we talked about It's been earlier, amazing. You know, if you can help somebody else and they go on to help thousands of people, does it really matter, you know, if you – how much money you make? Because there's <laughs> right. thousands of other people – that are helped because you help one person. You don't, I didn't, right. I didn't, I don't fucking know this. I didn't know this, you know, so, ugh, fucker, don't do this to me. Um, but that's why I do what I do. That's why I've always done what I do because it's not what I can do. It's what the people that you help can do. And then the, the, there's people that you've helped that are going to go on and do this, do bigger things than you do. And then, and on and on and on and on. So that, that's where my grumpy old man, as we talked about, <laughs> that's where it comes from. Cause what the fuck happens to us all if that stops, you know, that's fucked up, you know, it, it can't. So I, I'll keep being grumpy. I'll keep pitching. <laughs> I'll keep, you know, because I don't ever want that to stop because this shit that we do, you know, that's so stupid, this weightlifting stuff that our parents told us, what the fuck are you doing this for this stuff? man it changes people it changes their lives it changes other people's lives it does crazy things that otherwise wouldn't have happened you know for people maybe you find something else maybe not but it isn't you know and this is what i know you know what i'm saying when it's all you know you fucking roll with it and you figure out how you can roll with it the best way you can well it makes you feel good and it's really empowering to know that you know something you know somebody mm -hmm. asked that's what built up a lot of confidence in me obviously of my own lifting and a lot of that stuff was huge too mm -hmm. um but when somebody would ask me something and i would say something i would like hear myself and i'm like that was actually i think that was actually a pretty good answer mm -hmm. like, i think i'm actually like picking up some of it. it makes you feel amazing and then you actually see it work yeah that blows your mind or you say something to somebody and then you know four weeks later they come back to you and like hey dude uh remember i asked you that deadlift question in the gym and, and you're like yeah like my back doesn't hurt at all anymore and i'm like i don't even i don't remember even what, what you know remind mm -hmm. me of what i said yeah you know what the hell did i say you know and that that becomes really empowering then other people ask you stuff and then now you think you're like now you think that you know something which is which can be healthy it can also be <laughs> yeah it can also be dangerous because yeah. you have a lot more to oh, learn yeah. you know i that's where you know i think louis was on to something when he's teaching us you know not to lift but to coach because then you coach then you can help other people coach and then you know just it it's like a snowball, you know, it just keeps building and building and building from there. Do you think uh, people will get it 
Meaning, uh, I've heard Mark say this before. He's like, people aren't going to understand what I've been talking about probably till it's too late. Probably when I'm dead, that's when people are going to understand what I'm saying. So when you're saying, uh, you know, Louie told you to pay it forward, or he taught you how to pay it forward by helping, or sorry, the, the policemen that were helping you out, that's kind of where it started. Mm-hmm. You were, they helped you, so now you help more people. Mm-hmm. Do you think what you two are doing, do you think you've done enough to where like the next generation of lifters are going to be able to pay it forward to the following future lifters? I think if it's, if it's a passion of yours, and for me it is, you, you never do enough. You know, it's, it's never done. You know, it's going to keep, it's always going to happen. So even if I went completely out of business, I'm still going to be helping people train it, you know, because there's, like I said, this, there's so much to this that it's not just about what you do in the gym, you know, all that stuff, most of it, not all of it, but a very large percent of it carries over into relationships, business and everything else. The only part that doesn't carry over is the ego. You need a giant ego if you're going to lift big big weights, if you're going to be on the top of the heap of any sport, bodybuilding, whatever it is, you need a super ego. Everybody, you need to be selfish as fuck and you need a super ego. So that kind of comes with the terror. I'm not giving people permission to do that. I'm just stating a fact that I know from that. That does not jive well in business and relationships and other shit. And that's where I've all, I've been very vocal about my biggest regret through all this is how I treated my wife while I was still competing without a doubt, 100%. The only regret I have, that's it. No other regrets. That's it. And it was fucked up and it was wrong. I can't change it. I'll spend the rest of my life trying to make that back and make that better. Um, that aspect is never going to carry over well. <laughs> to it's just not it's not and if those people can't there there are a lot of people that were great great athletes in different disciplines and they still have the giant ego but they're not the ones that are holding the meetings in their companies and they're not the ceos they're the, they're more figurehead that people know this is an arrogant fuck this is the way it is and it's it's okay but all those other attributes that you learn in the gym they carry over to everything so even if they're not a great lifter, there's still the discipline, there's the consistency, there's, you know, kind of, you know, behind all the extremeness, there is a healthy lifestyle, you know, under that, like down here at this layer where all this layer is really unhealthy, but down here there's a foundation for that, GPP, conditioning, looking at what you're eating, all that stuff, it's all there. It's just, you know, pointed out later is a little, a little hard. You know what, I, oh, is this? I have a question about that, mm-hmm. the ego thing that you just mentioned. Um, and obviously you have <laughs> decades of seeing these top level athletes kill these massive weights and you've noticed a trend of them having a big ego. Mm-hmm. But do you think if these individuals are aware of that danger? You know, if they're aware mm-hmm. of, you don't think it's, it's possible to not have a big ego and still be able to attack those things? I think if it's a big enough ego, they're not going to be aware. Because the self-awareness is not going to come with that big ego. It's just the way it is. And if they are aware, that they, they, they don't have the ego. It's not, it's not there. You know, because trust me, the people that I'm talking about, they, they don't know. They might, but they don't give a fuck about it. They'll deal with the consequences later. Right now, there's a fucking meet in six months. You know, or, you know, they, it's what it is. You, you can get stuck in it. You know, if, if there's a problem with it, I don't think the problem is it. I think the problem is you get stuck in it. Mm. So then when you really are, it's like the stages of denial or stages of death. You know, you have, there's, there's this whole fucked up phase where you're really done, but you don't know you're done, but you still think you're going to keep going. But with that, you know, aside from the, you know, the competitive and all that stuff, your mind is still the person that started doing that so to all those people around you you're still the same fuck that they've been dealing with for five or six years and they're like when's this going to be over like this is what jl described to us today Mm -hmm. jl holdsworth was describing this today he he 
he had an ego and he didn't know any other way to to deal with stuff other than mm -hmm. like punch people in the face yeah his was huge it was yeah. huge and you you if you're training with it and you're working with it you have you embrace it you, it's like an innocence that you don't want to see somebody fuck up because you that's required now you don't want to see him do shit like punch people in the face and only because you, you if they break their hand they can't bench you know you you gotta this is how you got to explain it to these people you know if if you go out and get you know in a fight and you in jail and squat on friday and you miss the squat work then the fuck i ain't going out if i'm gonna miss the squat work i'll go out on friday night after i squat so it's those those are the consequences the real consequences aren't what a normal person is gonna see the real consequences are you're going to fuck up your squat workout. You only got eight of them left before the meet. It's like, oh, shit, I can't do that. So, yeah, but he his, he was one that, and I've known Jay. He's been a really good friend of mine for a long time. He's one that it, it, took, a, it took a long time for him to shed that, and it had to happen in layers, you know, over a period of time, and there had to be a little self-awareness and then acceptance of it. You know, that's a big part, too, because with that, there's a lot of things that you're going to regret. You know, this I have one giant one. That the other ones I've just come to terms. Fuck it, I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. But you got to deal with those. You got to accept them. If you can't accept them, you're gonna fight them. You know, and it's it's he's come a long way. Jail's come a really long way. You know, it's impressive. Yeah, yeah, he's come a long way from when he was crazy. Fuck, man, it was <laughs> crazy, crazy fuck. Is it harder to help other people, or is it harder to help your own family? My own family, because you're, you're you're too connected. You I know, think that's important know. for people to understand, like. You know, you kind of hear all the heroes, you know, are the people that are like, you know, in their community or the mm -hmm. people that are like with their family. And it's but it's true because it's fucking hard. You know, you know what? The other thing is you can bullshit other people to be able to get <laughs> to the end result you want. Yeah. You can't bullshit your family. Nope. They, you can't hide. They know you too well. You, you know, can't so, out. You can't yeah. outsource your relationship with your kids and stuff no, like that. I mean, no. you have to be there. You got to. There's a lot of time investment. There's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah. None of your tricks work. <laughs> you know, so they, they don't, and it is, it's, it's a big, the, the way that I've dealt with, with, to me, it's, I've never been a person that is, I, I don't believe, and this is just me, I don't believe in uh, quality time at all. It's, it's quantity. I don't, I personally, I, 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 I can't live with that personally. I just can't. That to me, that would be something that I would be using as an excuse to, to not, be there so i would rather just i want to be there so if it's if the kids are on the computer or whatever it is and i'm there for five hours and we're in the same room but we don't talk i'm there and my oldest is autistic so he's not going to talk all the time but when he does you know he'll sit down and talk for 45 minutes now if i'm not there, it may take 20 hours mm. to get that 45 minutes now, i don't get that 45 minutes if i don't invest those 20 hours so that's validation alone for me on that you know that, that i have to be there for the, for that and if not shit that 45 minutes if it was all quantity time i may never see it in a year and so forth and i know where other people are coming from because they don't have a choice you know i have a choice i made that choice when i founded the company to be when i'm kids get off the bus i'm there you know, I can work from wherever I want. And it's created a situation where the company's grown way slower than it probably could otherwise. But that's not why I did this. I did this so I could have time with my, if we go back to what I said, I was a personal trainer and didn't know how I was going to see my kids. So everything in line with success and how I'm going to define it, I've achieved it. Because they're almost 18 where I'm going to kick them out of the house because they're driving me fucking nuts. But I was there all the time. So they can never say I was never there. I can never regret that I was never there. And that, to me, that was important enough to change my entire life to be able to do. Yeah, what has the gym taught both of you about being a parent? Man, uh, I would have to say the key for me is is patience. <laughs> You know, because it, it just take, it takes a re it takes a really, really long time. I mean, if you want to be good at anything, it takes a long time. Um, but weights are something that really can't be rushed. You know, you might have a certain talent, you know, to be able to pick up a certain weight when you start out. But still, the, the, the progress and the progression is still going to take time. And if you want to be good at it, it might take a little bit of time. But if you want to be great at it, it's going to take a very long time. And I think the same is true with parenting. You just you need a lot of reps. You need a lot of sets. You need to, you need you know. I remember 
thinking that uh, don't cry over spilled milk is the dumbest fucking saying I've ever heard in my life <laughs> because whoever said that, that, that asshole that said that never had any kids mm -hmm. because spilled milk is fucking disgusting. If they spill <laughs> milk in the back of your car, oh. it smells like fucking, it smells like death, right? It's way worse than the smell of a shaker cup. Like it is so <laughs> disgusting and it like curdles and it gets stuck in like the carpet and stuff. It is just the most disgusting thing. So trying to have patience uh. with these little things mm -hmm. that, it might not seem like that. Oh, big deal. Your car stinks a little bit or something. But your car, like, it smells for, forever. You can't get rid of the smell. Um, and it's just like these little things. They, they add up, right? The kids, they, they, they constantly need attention or something's constantly happening. Or if you had both kids, if you ever had both kids sick at the same time or something like that, it takes a tremendous amount of patience. You're not sleeping for a few days. Both of them are coughing or both of them are puking or maybe they're puking and they have diarrhea and so do you and so does your wife. Like it's just a disaster. Like there's just crazy shit going on. But you can learn to deal with it, I think, through lifting, through trying to do everything the right way, trying to do everything as uh, to the best of your knowledge. You're trying to put everything together in your training and it's still going to shit. It's still, you're, you still hurt your back. You know, you got to the gym, you warmed up, you did all these things and you did your first set with 225 and for some reason your back went out some weird way and now you don't know what the hell to do. So mm -hmm. I think patience is the biggest thing for me. And I was going to say patience as well because the your, your kids are almost there. <laughs> A couple more years, they're going to start testing you. And the teenagers are this whole parent. Yeah, I got a twelve thing. and sixteen. Yeah, yeah. This parenting thing is a raw deal, <laughs> right? Because everybody's yeah, you got to have a fucking. Kid. Hey, somebody should have told me it's forever. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's actually kind of a crock of shit because <laughs> you have it and then you have one and you're like, what the fuck did I do? You can't sleep. It's whining and crying all the time. You got to feed the little fucker. It can't do anything on its own. And then it gets older and it's it's worse. Then you get a little reprieve, like seven, eight, like a oh, cute little kids that do this, do that. Then they start fucking talking more and talking back, saying no. And then they become a teenager and it's way fucking worse because now they don't listen. They lie. They steal. They do all kinds of all the shit that you did. It's going to be worse. So when's this good? You know what I'm saying? The little fucker doesn't shovel the driveway or mow the lawn. Like, when do I get my money back? It's like fucked up. But anyhow, jokes aside the the patience is fucking huge because you you end up in some really weird situations that i don't hear a lot of parents talking about but you know your kids start showing disrespect and you gotta how do you teach respect you know you gotta throw them against the wall punch them in the face you know what you can't do that so what are you gonna do so where's that line where's that line going to be for you and when you've you've had to cross that line in different ways because you can't get strong you throw your back out with 225 you're pissed off because you didn't make a max effort lift or you missed it and you're mad for a fucking week and all this stuff you're able to kind of step back and, and reassess the same way you would with lack of progress in the gym where even if you're dieting and you're trying to get leaner and all of a sudden, boom, what the fuck happened? You put on three pounds of water out of nowhere and you're, you're what the fuck you're mad in those situations. You learn to step back, reassess what's going on. What's what, what, what is really happening? Like, did I, did you with the two pounds of water retention, did you really gain three pounds? No, and you, in the moment though, yeah, <laughs> you, it's it, yeah. like fucked up. You want to take a diuretic, you want to do all this crazy shit. Go do nine hours of cardio. You're figuring the calories up, like fuck three pounds. How many calories is it going to take to burn that off? Like nine thousand calories. How many minutes on this bike is that? Two days. <laughs> fuck it, I'm doing it. You know, but you step back. Like, what is this? Why this happened? Is it cortisol? Am I stressed? And then you're like, oh, it's that. And then you can fix it. You see what I'm saying? Where yeah. because of that experience of stepping back, assessing, and then kind of finding the solution and multiple solutions, same thing. Kids pissing you off. It's like, man, I want to slap this little fucker across the face. <laughs> Step back. What? What's really happening here? Mm -hmm. Like, why? Why is this situation? Why did it happen? Now, this is the outcome. What was the cause? And then look, same thing, right? With the training, what is the actual cause and not the outcome? You can address the outcome with a Band-Aid, with a diuretic, 
slapping the kid in the face. <laughs> but, you know, whatever you can address, but you're still not going to fix the cause. And that you learn through training. I think, uh, you know, everybody always needs time. You know, like think about when you're mad or upset. I think everybody always needs time. I don't think kids are any different. So like what we've done in my house is we we try to, we're like, hey, let's just let's just talk about it later. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. The kid storms off and he says "f you" or something. Like, I haven't really had anything that crazy, but I've had them, you know, yeah, talk back yeah, and yeah, say yeah. no and be completely disrespectful. Mm-hmm. Of course, everyone, every parent, I think, has dealt with that uh, to some extent. But I think you actually want that. Like, I want my kids to be heard. I want them to be able to think they can voice their opinion. What I don't want them to do is to try to like take like a cheap shot. I don't want them to say anything too derogatory. Uh, I don't want them to say something under their breath. Like, no, no. What'd you say? Like, let's have a conversation. I want to know. Mm-hmm. Like, let's sit down and let's ha- let's communicate about this. Like, don't don't go turn the other way, mumbling about something. You know, about taking out the garbage or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. Um, so we've always tried to say, hey, look, let's because if you can talk about it later you can probably have you can probably be more level headed so you can say all right you know and then i can go to my son and i can say jake you know have have i have you seen me treat you this way before like have i if i have then that's not a great way to handle things like you know you just kind of yelled at me and you were very disrespectful do are you learning that from me like i are you yeah. seeing me doing that? Like, am I having that communication with anybody else? Do I treat my friends, my employees, my, my family, you know, our family members? Do you see me, you know, because I, I don't believe that that's a good way to live. I don't believe that's a good way to do things. And, and he wouldn't be able to, I mean, he could maybe reference a time I threw something or something like mm-hmm. that and, and was pissed at something. But, I mean, it's really extremely rare for me. So, you know, trying to lead by example and trying to say, hey, like, where is this coming from? How can I help? Uh, the other thing that I've done, uh, which I think helps a lot, and no one knows how to fucking parent, by the way. Now, I'm not saying I do. Mm-hmm. These Don't are worry. things that have helped me. Um, the other one is to, you know, just go to them and say, hey, uh, you got my attention. You know, what, what do you need? How, 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 do, I, how do I help you? Because mm-hmm. a lot of times that's all they're look, all looking yeah. for. Something's fucking bugging them. Could be something at school. It could be something that you're doing. You could not be around uh, enough. You could, uh, they don't like that you don't knock on their door. It could be. Look, it could be a million things. Yeah, Kids yeah. have a lot of shit to think about. Obviously, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't know, oh, yeah. you got to find out. So if you don't know, you, they got to tell you somehow. How this, do you... Uh, oh, oh, good. Hmm? Well, I was actually wondering about this because um, we've talked a lot about this in the past before. Uh, I've gotten messages from like guys like 18, 19, 20 or whatever, right? And they just started training. And I feel like... I'm lucky that I was able to start training at 12 or 13 because when I got into powerlifting at a base and when I was young, I was naive. So I would just train and I would get stronger over time. I didn't think about the time it was taking me. I didn't realize, oh, I've already been doing this for a while. You start at 12, you start at 13. And I feel like we're lucky in that sense because when I talk to a lot of people in their 20s and their 30s that are starting this training thing, they, they find that having that patience is difficult. They're not okay with making those small gains over time. They, they, they're getting, I mean, I understand it's normal to get frustrated with training, totally normal, but it's like they're not willing to just continue to put in that time and let the progress happen. So what would your advice be to those people who are aware of their lack of, of progress or they're aware that like there's a guy that's 22 and I'm 32, but he's so much farther than me. How do you, what, 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 what advice do you have for them? Um, a couple, uh, there's a couple of things. I, I think that everybody should kind of screw around for a while. They, they should experiment and figure out what's going to work for them, what's not. I think there's not enough of that anymore. I think there's too many answers that people need to go in and kind of fuck around and figure out what works, what doesn't work. With training, though, there's, there's beginner gains. All right, it messes with a lot of mm-hmm. people because they start doing things and they're making really fast progress for four or six months and they don't understand why it doesn't keep happening. You know, and that's where the frustration comes because after six months, they're like, you know what? I should be benching 2,000 pounds in five years because <laughs> if you look at the rate that they were gaining, why would they not? You know, if, <laughs> it, hell, if they just put on 20 a year for, you know, yeah. 50 a year for 10 years, think about that. It's huge. And so with, with that aside, what 
what I will ask the the younger kids like you're talking about is if I'll, I will ask them if they have a GED or a high school degree. And almost every, in all cases almost, they're going to say, yeah, how long did that take you? Did you think about that when you were in third grade? Or did you just kind of always know that you were going to finish high school? How much, they don't put a lot of thought into it. And now that they're through it, think back, was that really that long? And like, man, that was, well, and if they like, well, yeah, it was a long time. Well, what about high school? When you went into high school, did those years go fast? Like, yeah, it flew by. Like, or you could ask them, depending upon the time of the year, you know, do you remember what, do you remember last Christmas? Say it's 11 months ago. Yeah, like yesterday. That was 11 months ago. See, you know, there's always something that you can reference 11 months or two years ago that's going to be fresh in somebody's mind like it was yesterday. It's not that long ago. It, really, it's a blink in time if you think about it. You know, the longer you're alive, you start to realize the longer, you know, the the the, the, how small a year really is it, it's not that long two years is not three years is not that long if somebody starts training and they can in four years if they have any kind of genetic substance for this in four years they can be fucking jacked you know if they're consistent you know eat well you know do the right things most of the time four years is forever if you look at some of the people that you've known the progress now other people in four years it's 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 hard you know it's just bad luck of the draw but it's still four years is a long time you know invest that time because you look that's that's the key i think is you got to find something to reference them back and they're like oh okay that's not that long they're still gonna be frustrated i mean we i still get frustrated i'm losing shit every year it's like fuck how do i get back but everybody nobody's gonna progress it have you ever heard somebody say I gain too fast. You know, it's the only time I've ever heard a statement like that is a top lifter getting ready for a meet saying, look, I'm a little ahead of schedule. I need to back off because they can see it's unrealistic that they're going to hit 125 pound PR. They might peak early. Yeah. They don't want to peak. They don't want to get hurt. So they're going to back it. That's the only time ever. Nobody's ever told me my arms are getting too big. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. You mentioned earlier having an autistic child. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know what that means. I, I, you know, we have a kid in our gym that that comes in from time to time. I, I've heard the term obviously mm -hmm. a lot, but I, I also uh, recognize that there's a, a wide variety of mm -hmm. people that are autistic. Um, you know, what what does your son have, and uh, how do you guys deal with it? His diagnosis would be Asperger's. So autism is a huge spectrum. It, I, the spectrum is actually a not even a really good term to kind of define it anymore, but people can fall all over, you know, the place on there. So it could be high functioning and high functioning, low behavior. So the intelligence can be higher than the social behaviors. Some could be um, not audible. You know, they, they won't speak, but they can still process it. They're all they're, the, the the statement is once you've met one autistic child, you met one autistic child. They're they're all kind of different. Mm. So Blaine is um, Asperger. So behavioral wise, he's probably if I was to define it as simply as I could, behavior wise, he's probably if he's seventeen, he's probably like a twelve year old behavior wise, and maybe look, it depends on the circumstance, but that's easy. And intelligence or Book smart wise, he could probably graduate high school now. So he has no issues with school, but he can't go to the public school because the triggers, pencils in a classroom, people talking, stuff is too much. So he's at a school that's for autism and the teachers are great and they still learn all the material actually at a higher level because he's higher functioning than what he would learn in the public system. And at his pace. So if he was in the public system where, where I'm from here, he would be put in a special ed class and be learning at the slowest person in the class's pace. Mm. Where now he's learning at the pace of what he can do. So as he's gotten older, what are some of the things he, I don't know if he will or will not be able to drive. So that's a bridge that we're kind of crossing now with simulators and stuff like that. Does he have a temper. Co coordination? No, that's that's fine. It's we address that really soon on with training and stuff like that. So, 
it's still not he's not a pro athlete coordination but he's big you know mm -hmm. that my fear is for him it's the it's anger management and he's 5'11 240 right now so and he's probably carrying 20 more than what he should and but if that if that's not bringed under control he can be 270 mm -hmm. before he finishes high school and he's strong like a bull so so he gets pissed and hauls off and punches the teacher. It's doing damage now. Where before it wasn't that big, you know. It's still a big deal, but it was. It's uh, now he graduates and does that. The police are coming. Mm -hmm. So this this is where the issues start coming in as they get older, and so the the every year is a little different to be able to figure it out. So what the profession will be, what he'll do. I, I don't know. He's smart enough. So he can do whatever he wants to do. But all he wants to do now is play video games and watch YouTube. So, you know, that, that's... Like every other kid in America. Exactly. It it, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not that <laughs> abnormal. And he'll find, he'll find his way. He'll find his path. And, but he gets frustrated with, um, with other people, social situations, stuff like that. So it's working on that. And school helps with that. He can, he can cook for himself. It's, hmm. He should not have any problem being independent now our, our 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 willingness to let him be independent is another conversation which that you know my wife and i will have to well, figure out uh why does he get mad he can't um like interpret it the right way or he gets frustrated can't communicate properly yeah, or? i think what happens is he gets mad the same way any of us would get mad where a lot of times you'll get mad many times throughout the day you just uh, whatever you know, you get mad, fuck, you know, just catch yourself and you just kind of come yeah, back. Yeah, pissed. Where he'll get mad, he'll get pissed, and then he can't let it go, right? And then a little longer will go by and he gets even more mad. Now he's mad because he can't let it go. Mm. Okay? I get mad. Yeah, I get mad because I get mad. Yes. I'm like, fuck, why am I mad? I shouldn't be mad. Yeah. That starts <laughs> this, this whirlwind where now he's mad, like you said, he's mad because he's mad, but he doesn't <laughs> even remember why he's mad. So now he's mad about that. And now he's mad because why, why do I get mad about, th why do I, now it's less, why do I have this happen? Why is this? Why? Mm -hmm. And he's, now he's mad because of that. Then he's mad because he can't control it. And it's just this spiral that there, you got to find a way to stop, you know? And when he was younger, it could be compressions. There, there were things that we could do, sensory things that we could do and they don't work like they used to, but it's so much more rare where before it was like multiple times a day dozens of times a day now it's once every six months mm -hmm. but that he graduates he gets in a workforce that once every two years is somebody calling you know security or police because mm -hmm. the kid just threw a desk through the office <laughs> so it's that that's where it is with that so he's he's come a long way how do you get enough attention to your other child? Does it uh, sometimes divert your attention? Because I'd imagine, you know, with him being autistic, it must be. When they were younger, I think it did. Yeah. I think it did. Now it's not because, you know, it's, they, they, they hate each other. Well, no, my, my, my autist, my Blaine does not like his brother at all. And it's <laughs> okay. not a brother thing. He just does not. I don't know if that will ever happen. He just can't. <laughs> I, I, and I can't tell. Because I, I do think with him there is a little, there's either, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like animosity or something? No, like that. When, when you, empathy, hmm. where I don't know if he doesn't have empathy for him or if it's so much he doesn't know how to uh, act, display it. Right. So with that's one of the things with a, a lot of kids on the spectrum is, you know, a lot of people pigeon toe and handcuff and say they don't have any empathy. And other ones will say no, they have too many. It's, it's mm. kind of hard to figure out. And it's my own kid. I still can't really figure out with that. But that now it's not bad because they just kind of leave each other alone. But my my youngest, only a year younger, will still do shit just to piss his brother off. Is yeah. it hard to figure out whether your son is uh, acting a certain way because he's autistic or whether he's acting a certain way because he's just being an asshole kid? It is now. And now it is because yeah. he's older. Yeah. You know, so now it is. So it's like, oops. Every once in a while, your kid's an asshole. Yes. Like everyone's yeah. kid's an asshole. Yeah, my younger one, I know. <laughs> I mean, the younger one, I know. It's like, dude, you're not on the spec. This shit don't, <laughs> this shit don't You fun. ain't got an excuse. Yeah, yeah there's no yeah. fucking excuse with this. Right. Um, so, yeah, that is that is a concern. That's it's 
what is going on and but it, it's kids are different you know they're, they're completely different and so what i may see is disrespect from one of, and when i say disrespect I'm, I'm speaking more about how they will speak to my wife and how they talk to their mom you know that that's where my threshold i, I don't do well with that mm-hmm. you know that that doesn't fly so what may be seen as disrespect to one isn't to the other and that's where you know it's, it's kind of filtering it out to because they're not the same you know, to kind of go from that but in a social setting and when he comes in the gym with the people that are here he's known some of these people his whole life because mm-hmm. he's coming in the gym when he was in a little you know carry on stroller whatever they call those things so he's cool with everybody here he likes everybody here he'll joke around with them um sheena has been training him for god knows how long eight years or whatever it is it's fine with all that so he you know he'll like doing that but he still would rather just stay home you know, even though he likes the people he still just rather stay home i think he gets some of that from me but um where my other one is like my wife he wants to go do shit all the time go everywhere I'm like fine take your take trace and go I'll just stay here with Blaine. He'll play his video games and I'll fucking work, yeah. you know, read or whatever I'm going to do. I know with uh, bodybuilding, you got some consulting, uh, you know, with your diet. You got mm-hmm. consulting with how you train. Um, and I, I would imagine with your business, you must have had a lot of consulting over mm-hmm. the years. Did you have someone consult your, you and your wife uh, about how to deal with autism? Yeah. Um, that was the, the first years were really, really hard because when he was – a baby there was there were problems you know every baby cries and has a fit not everyone does it for eight hours a day Mm. or for an hour and a half at a stretch so you go say you take the kid to dinner something like that starts crying and it doesn't stop and you realize shit i'm that person you know that you use now i have no problem (laughs) when kids are crying and uh it's like it's white white noise to you yeah i feel sorry for you i get it man and um that getting the diagnosis was really hard it was it was way hard for me way harder for me than for my wife because i did not i was labeled you know dyslexic learning to say i was in special ed classes i oh my god i fought that shit so fucking hard because i know what i know that road i know it real well and i didn't like it i didn't like it at all and this was like death to me like you're gonna send my kid down this fucking road I, I no, I, do. I still I can't vocalize. You know how fucked up that was, and at the same time, I'm thinking to myself that because he is he's adopted. But aside from that, I'm thinking to myself that you know God brought this kid to me because I navigated that road. I know that road. I can help him mm-hmm. with this, and but things changed a lot since I was a kid. So, I mean, back when I was a kid, it was learning disabled. That was LD. That was it. Now there's like a billion different diagnoses. That, right. that was it. And then dyslexia came. It's like every every new one that came out, I got. Like, <laughs> you know, you're ADD. I'm like, it fucking didn't exist before. Now I'm something that didn't exist. <laughs> you know, so by the time I finished high school, I was like 12 fucking things. I started out with one. And <laughs> so I, I fought that because I, I knew the classes. I knew all and it, it was hard and what it took was other parents that had kids on the spectrum explaining to me that there's all these services that are available you know ieps individual education programs through schools and everything else that you get you don't get at all unless you have a diagnosis mm-hmm. i'm like fuck i can't i can't, there's no way he's going to be able to sit in the classroom but I can't put him in a different classroom unless he has an IEP. You know, I can't get him all these services that can help him unless I have this IEP, but I need a diagnosis for this IEP. And this, mm. boom, 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 you know, this I had to let go of the past, you know, what my, my experience, my experience is not my kid's experience. And that was a hard, hard, hard thing to accept. And I can tell you stories about meetings with teachers and schools and, and you know, I'm, sitting there and i'm so and so's not here well what fucking classroom are they in 113 sit here i'll be back and going and getting the teacher and bringing them down tell me your story you know and just uh crazy shit that's when when we got him where he is now 
then there's their services and there's other parents to speak to and then some, some consulting in a way but just I think it's more of speaking to people that are dealing with the same things mm. because you start to pick up that this is going to sound bad but you start to pick up these parents don't fucking care they're just they're they're delegating mm. you know their kid just getting rid of them you know to somebody else like here's take care of my problem that and does they, sound bad but it's also very understandable mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I, I i don't understand it because i was never in that situation mm -hmm. but i could imagine just being at the end of your rope mm -hmm. like not knowing how to help your child would be i mean all you're trying to do as a dad is to protect your child mm -hmm. and if they were to cry all the time or if it if something you had to deal with all the time it'd be understandable. We, we met with, uh, we had somebody on our podcast that actually uh, trained uh, people that had Down syndrome and autism. And mm -hmm. uh, that was really, really cool to see how he took them through like physical training, step ups and box jumps and all different kinds of movements and squats and deadlifts. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was uh, absolutely amazing to see he was, the way he was able to interact with those kids. But those kids were being dropped off, yes. you know, for a reason. Like it wasn't that the parent you know, research that lifting weights could help mm -hmm. with coordination, help with a lot of things. They it's were their just, break. Yeah, it's, it's their, their break. hour and a half or hour it's break. A, yeah, so it's the, so those I was just kind of like, you know, it's nice to meet you. Yeah. And then the, you find the ones that really, I don't want to say they give a shit because I'm sure the other ones do. They're just carrying in a different way. Yeah. Where you talk to the other ones like, what, what do you do? What do you do? And the f the biggest thing for me was, and I don't know if it's just location, demographics, and so forth, is I would go to these things when he was younger that were group activities, pumpkin patch, shit like that. Like, where are all the dads? Like, it's me and like, all the moms. <laughs> yeah, like, I always well, saw that too. <laughs> yeah, like this dad left, this dad, they're divorced, 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 divorced. Like, what the fuck? You know, these kids, what the fuck? This, how's this... As a single mom dealing with this, right. like, this is a big chunk. It's easier now that he's older because he's more independent. But when they're younger, it's like, man, what the, it's crazy. And the training thing to fall back on that is when my Sheena, who's our uh, editor, managing editor here, she's been with us for know, eight years or whatever it was. Her background was in training kids with autism. So I used to bring Blaine to the gym and just, I tried, you know, to work just basic stuff and it just wasn't working. And she wrote a little note one day because she was out there training and say, hi, my name is Sheena. And they were passing this note back and they built this little relationship and he started working with her and she documented all this stuff on our site. And what I started to realize is everything that we know about training, we started at a basic level, say a, a box jump or whatever it is in a push up. And we have progressions. Well, there's regressions. I'm like, what the fuck? What is a re? It's like under what you're able to do. Like mm. he can't, he can't do a box jump, or he can't even squat. So we're just gonna start with jumping over a line and jumping over the lines, dropping the hips, you know, a little mm. bit, and then, you know, shit. I never would have thought of that. Like the hell you know it's getting them ready for something that's going to happen two years away which i know that you know i get this two-year program i get right, that right, right. but it was so weird and um the the interesting thing was i love to squat i love to squat and it's like my shit you know it's my i will do that until the day i lie even i'll be the old fucking guy that can't move and put a safety squat bar on with a dime on each side i'm gonna i'm gonna die trying to squat a dime on each side but anyhow I, I fucking love there's just something about standing up with shit you can't that's on your head I, I can it's a different feeling there's nothing compared to that Blaine wouldn't squat anytime I'd have him squat he wouldn't do it he wouldn't even do a free squat I'm like what the fuck you can't have a kid that's not squatting yeah it was just driving me not, nuts like, not in this not family squat? this is the greatest thing <laughs> in the world like how in the hell is this not possible <laughs> and it took like five years to realize that he associated that with pain oh. and straining because he grew up in a gym with bloody noses and purple faces and <laughs> giant heads and shit popping all over the place you know pimples popping and people coming up and you know the strain of a face with the shit that we're like yeah look at that you know he's like ooh shit no i don't want to do that that's dangerous shit and so it, it was figuring that and i'm like oh fuck i see that now where maybe it's not cool if somebody doesn't know what's going on and um so he's he's fine with he still doesn't like to squat but he's fine with you know 
doing the stuff that he does now. And it's, it's a crazy bridge because you have a kid, you're a parent as well, and you want them to train. You know what this can do for the rest of their life, and you don't. You can fuck up everything else, but you don't want to fuck that one up. Right. I don't. It's like I don't want to fuck that one up because it's so important in, in my head. And so I can't force it because I'll break it. Yeah, you're trying to naturally let it happen, but at the same time, you're like, come on, yeah, let's go. exactly. And so with him, it's like this once a week thing. It's been a once a week thing for a long time. I'm like, let's get more. And my and my youngest, you know, just started training. I don't know if it's going to last. I'm not pushing it because I don't want to fuck it up. You know, I'm really good at fucking things up. So I don't want to fuck this up because of that. But at the same time, I want him to, I don't have to compete. I don't have to do any of that. But I want him to to embrace it and see it for what it really is. But the hardest person you asked before about, you know, other people in your family, the hardest people for me to train in my own fucking family. And it's what the hell, what kind of coach am I? If I can't, you know what I'm saying? It makes you doubt everything, you know, and you think, you know, a lot like, God yeah, damn. people come up to you and they're like, you changed my life. And you're like, you're like, I'm trying to impact the people at home, but it's I know tough. it's like, I can't even get my own kid to show up to train. You're like, what the, what the fuck am I doing wrong? So it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Thank you so much for sharing all yes. that. Uh, no, it's probably not. It's probably not easy, but I think it's important to talk about. You no, know I, I, mean? I freely talk about the autism and and Blaine, and it probably more than I should. You know, the tons of we did a little documentary type thing, you know, with him, and I think that people need to see it. They they need to be aware. You know, I it's kind of a I get autism awareness. I get the awareness thing, but to me, it's just kind of a dumb word. Yeah. You know, I think other people need to to understand, and, and even people that have kids on the spectrum. Again, this is going to sound a little rough. They need to quit using that as an excuse. You know, it's I'm, and people get pissed when I say this, but if I have Blaine, and an example I have is a few years ago, we were at a pool and we were on vacation. He's making a lot of noise, and somebody told me you can get your kid to shut up, and I said no. You know, if, you know, he got pissed and he left. And I'm like, that's, I'm not going to tell my kid, uh, tell that person in front of my kid, I'm sorry he's autistic. I'm not going to allow my kid to use that as an excuse or be an acceptable excuse. I'm not. And if that means somebody's going to get pissed because he was too loud in the pool, which he was. And I did tell him after the dude left, look, calm it down a little bit i'm not going to give some fucking guy i don't know will never see again the rest of my life any validation or power over anything that my son's going to be imprinted in his head or in an elevator if the kid presses all the buttons you know i'll say i apologize i'm not going to say i'm sorry he's autistic I'm not going to do that you know he can do that if he chooses when he's older but i'm not so i think other parents need to kind of think about the message that they're sending to their to their kids in that situation well and then even further on that same thing be really careful about what you think they can and can't do yes and don't share your cards on that one because that they might if they have some disabilities they might have even more or they might not be able to overcome them mm -hmm. if you're kind of shoving that on then oh i'm sorry you know he can't do that he can't he keeps hearing that right that's the thing, Shit. you know, and that's where when I said I, I walk this path, I know this path, I know how to navigate this path, I know the negativity of this path, you know, I know what it feels like to be told you're stupid, you can't do this, you can't do that. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let that. No way. No way at all. There is a way. You know, there's always a way. Maybe for yourself, maybe you can't read well. You can listen. You can listen to audio books. You can watch videos. There's there's so many ways now that weren't there 20 years yeah. ago. They're there. It's so what? You don't like to read. Big fucking deal. Listen. You know, find other ways to learn. That's no excuse to not learn. Everybody can learn. You, you know, so that that's, no, I'm not going to let that <laughs> shit fly. <laughs> awesome, man. Thanks again. Um, Andrew, where can people find you? Uh, well, first off, thank you for mm -hmm. allowing us to, you know, use your guys' equipment and all this good stuff and have us like a, like a multicast, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, it's at I am Andrew Z. And actually, I think Zach, right? Is that the name? Yeah, he reached out like uh, maybe about a year ago or so. 
he had been following the podcast and he was just like hey i got an internship over there i had elite ft uh elite mm-hmm. fts and like you know he wanted some advice and mm-hmm. so when we were talking about paying it forward i got lucky because you know mark gave it, he gave me a chance to uh to help out with the podcast and so he's like you know yeah i got this internship and i'm like well dave tate's kind of a hard ass so just don't make any excuses <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the second you make an excuse for something it's over I'm like so <laughs> You know, just you know, stick with bad. it. Yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so um, but so again, thank you. But yeah, my uh, Instagram is at I am Andrew Z. But please make sure you guys are following the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project Podcast um, at MB Power Project on TikTok and Twitter. We're all over the damn place. Uh, and Sima Yang, where are you at? At Sima Yang on Instagram and YouTube. At Sima Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Mark, I'm um, at Mark Smelly Bell. Thanks again. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you guys for coming out. <laughs> Yeah.